This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. A very, very good afternoon to you all from the Sentence Alimentary as well as CTEC Alimentary School. You are now with Sydney. I am traveling with Senzo. And you can ask your teachers to ask us questions. We are by the western side of the Kruger National Park Juma Game Reserve this afternoon. I am right at Chitwa Dam, which is one of the dams in the reserve. Already I have seen there is quite a lot of interesting animal activities here. I do have some hippopotamus, quite a lot of different groups at the same dam. So we have got quite a lot to enjoy at this stage here. See, oh, look at that. That's a beautiful hippo there. So these hippopotamus are not trying to hide away from us. This is how they live. Hippopotamus, during the day, they must have to come and spend water and spend time by the water holes just in order to control their body temperatures because they don't like sunburn. Interesting to see that these animals, they spend much of their time in these water holes, but as soon as the sun goes down, it is a wake-up call. They must then all wake up here and go out and go long distances in search of food. Let's just see what's happening here. They are very much relaxed at the moment, and a group of hippopotamus together is called a school. It's a school of hippopotamus. So hippopotamus are at school. You can see they are all enjoying the sun because it has been very much cold here in this area for the past couple of days. So today is the first day the sun is very hot like this, which is good and appreciated by animals such as the hippopotamus. So now I will be here in order to see what is going to happen next. But while I am here waiting to see what is going to happen, we can go to my other colleagues and see what they have got in the park at the moment. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our live afternoon safari. It is a very warm welcome and a very good to have you on board. Hopefully, you're going to be asking us lots of questions as we explore the wilderness in a very different way. So you've seen Sydney's on a vehicle, but we're going to be out on foot, and we're going to try and find a lot of the smaller things that you might not see from a car. We're also going to be able to look at the tracks, so little footprints that animals leave, and so it should be a really good afternoon. My name is Tristan, and on camera, I've got David this afternoon, and we're going to try and show you you all kinds of smaller interesting things now one of the things I was saying that we look for is tracks and so there's lots of different types of tracks that often get left by the animals obviously they've all got very different feet so if you guys all had to take your shoes off and go and get into the sand and walk you'll find a situation where everybody's foot will look slightly different and it's the same with the animals and so using that we're able to then try and find where the animals walked because some of the animals they don't stick to the roads and they're not just going to be sitting on a tree waiting for us they're going to have a situation where they're going to walk through the bush and so we have to try and find them somehow and using their tracks is the best way now when you come along onto a road like this you can see that it's very kind of sandy very loose sand and it easily leaves a footprint so these are some footprints from us where we've walked around but next to it is a footprint of an animal now it might not be very easy to see but if you have a look here at the back i'm going to get a stick for you sorry david but if you look here at the back you can see that there is a little shadow that is coming down now that shadow has got two lobes at the back so that's how we know already that this is for a hyena because the hyenas have two lobes if it was a lion or a leopard we would have a third lobe and it would have these three little sort of round circles at the back the other reason that we know it's a hyena is because if you look here here are the toes there's one toe there two three four all right so four toes on a hyena and then you'll find little claw marks 
at the front. So a hyena has its claws out and it leaves a little mark like this. And so this hyena would have been walking around last night. We've had a bit of wind today and that's blown some of the wind into the track and that's how I know it's from last night. Also hyenas are more nocturnal than they are diurnal. So by looking at tracks like this, this is how we're able to find animals and see if we can try and track them down and actually locate them. And it's a very, very important skill to learn out here. So it's something that we practice quite a lot and we'll try and see if we can use this afternoon to find you some interesting things. Now, you've met Sydney, you've met myself, but there is a third member of the team that is out and about. His name is Ralph and he wants to say hello. Well, hello and good afternoon to all you kiddies out there, wherever you are in the world. My name is Ralph Kirsten, and on the camera today I've got Fergus, who's going to be helping me look for all those animals today. And I want you to send all your questions through your teacher, because we want to know what you want to know about the African bush. Well, I've got something that I would love to show you, and it's very exciting. Let's look on over there, because we've got a beautiful uh, sleeping leopard. And look how much he's panting. Why is he panting like that? Well, it doesn't look like he's been working very hard, but his stomach is full of food. So he is like me when I've had my Christmas dinner and I need to go and lie on the couch and uh, do all the digesting of my uh, very big dinner that I've eaten. And so that's what he's doing right now, and that's why he's breathing so fast. Isn't he beautiful? He is a very pretty cat, isn't he? He's a little boy. And for now, I think he's just dreaming about chasing rabbits. Look at that. A little pink nose. He is a very special kitty cat, isn't he? A leopard in the Kruger Park of South Africa. Wow! A very wild animal he is. He goes wherever he wants, whenever he wants. He's not tame and he is 100% wild. And that is so awesome, I think. And look at him. And he's got very special spots, don't you think? They are very particular. Got spots all the way down the black spots and then some of them are like rosettes and little roses with brown color on the inside he's got a very white belly with lots of black spots there as well and at least we know he's alive by that panting that he's doing because if he wasn't panting like that we'd think that he's dead he's just really so relaxed now well, it seems like there's all sorts happening this afternoon, and we're going to sit and see if this little beautiful leopard gets up any time soon, but I'm going to send you over to Sydney at the waterhole. You can see I've got a very beautiful sighting. Look at that. Look at that opening the mouth just to show us the teeth. Mm, that is one of the little ones. So the little ones, uh, they they are very much protected by the parents. I can see they always is between the parents. These two, they nearby. So uh, what we have seen just now is how the hippopotamus shows that they are happy or not. When the hippopotamus are not happy, they will open the mouth just like that one did and start just spreading water everywhere. The tooth are very much long. They can grow up to 50 centimeters. So you can see that is quite a very long size. It is a very peaceful animal during the day when they're by the dam, but because of going distances in order to use those teeth for grazing purposes, they can be dangerous outside the dams. No, oh, the little one just disappeared, it's playing there. So they can go down there and submerge like this just for about a few minutes, not too much and they come out again for breathing purposes. There it goes again. So look at that. The head is, is uh, arranged in a very interesting manner because they look at that. 
beautiful, exciting. I really love hippos. When they're opening the mouth, is so very much stunning. Quite a very long mouth. When it's opened, it's, it's just like something very big. So they always make sure that they are seeing what is happening. They don't go down for a long time. Yes, they've got to breathe, but they must also watch out. They are in a very peaceful mood. Look at that one submerging again. Did you hear that? This is very much interesting. Listen to that. So they make very big sound. Listen to that. So that is just a, that is quite a confirmation that we are really enjoying the hippos activities. It's better than seeing them doing nothing. So now they are showing us another way, which is a way of communication. That is how they talk. They make that kind of a very big noise. It's like a roar. If you don't know how the lion roars, you can get confused from very far because that sound is very much thick and it can travel long distances. Oh, we've got something interesting again. Uh, Kate, I've got your question. The reason why the hippopotamus has to go underwater is about maintaining the body temperature. So they must have to every time go down and then they come out again for breathing. When the sun is getting too much hot, they go down. These kind of animals, they are lacking of uh, sweet glands. They don't sweat. So they must have to control their body temperature by going out, in and out again, just like that. So they experience too much sunburn. You can see again, it's going down. But when the sun is not too much, sometimes they come out. So I'm, I'm still going to see what's going to happen here again next. Now we can go to Ralph and see what uh, Hosanna is doing on the other side. Well, he's still doing exactly what he was doing when we first got here. And uh, he hasn't moved except for the breathing that he's doing there, trying to digest all that meat that he's gobbled up. And Samston, thank you very much for your question. You want to know why this leopard is all on his own? Well, Samston, uh, that's what leopards do. They walk around on their own. It's only the lions that like to stay in big groups, and they have lots of them around. But leopards like to stay all on their own. The only other one that likes to walk around in groups sometimes uh, are the cheetahs. But you mostly find leopard on their own, and sometimes, if you're very lucky, you might see two of them together, but that's normally only with a mommy and her cub. And, uh, well, that's quite special. But this is very normal, what we're seeing here, a little leopard on its own. Well, I say little. He's not that small, actually, especially with that big fat belly of his now. Sure. Hey? He was quite a greedy old chap, wasn't he? He's really eaten a lot. And now he doesn't have to eat for a few days after he eats as much as he has. So it's not such a bad thing. But as you can see, it's very hard work to start digesting all that food. And he must be quite uncomfortable. Now, Abigail, uh, you know what is so amazing about the wild is that the animals take care of themselves. 
So all we do is we show you what the animals get up to. But we don't look after them. All we do is uh, put the, the camera on them and watch them. So that's all we do. We use a camera. Sometimes I use my binoculars as well. And we just drive around and watch the animals doing what they do. So we don't look after them like they do in a zoo where they might go and feed them and and wash them and look after them like that all the animals out here they're so clever they can look after themselves so that's what's so nice about wild animals they look after themselves and you know what they enjoy that more than being in the zoo because that's a very small space imagine you could run around wherever you wanted to and then uh, just one day your mom said you have to stay in your room uh, because you've been naughty you don't like that do you you don't like staying just in your bedroom you want to go and play outside and run all over the place and do whatever you want to I know uh, I also do but um, these animals really do prefer to be out on their own in the wild and doing whatever they want to and I would too well I do <laughs> Okay, so this sleepy cat, I think, isn't going to be doing too much. So we might move on a little bit, and I'm sure that we could come back a little bit later, and he wouldn't even have moved. Well, I'm sure he's not going to move. He's got a very big tummy, and the reason why he's got a big tummy is because as we've been walking through this block, we've noticed something, and I have a theory as to how Hosanna ended up with a meal and a very, very big tummy. Now, when you're walking out in the bush, it's often very good to look for all kinds of clues that can tell you a story, because ultimately everything out here has a little story to it, and so what we do is we walk along these pathways, because these pathways are where all the animals move. It's like a little highway, so it's a road. You can imagine when you come out of your house, you take the same road. Animals will often use the same roads. And in this little block that I've made here, we have a track. And it looks a little bit like what you saw earlier with the hyena track, but it's not a hyena. This is an animal that is very, very rare that we don't see very often, and it's called a wild dog. Now, wild dogs sort of differ from the hyenas in their track in the way that the shape of the track looks. This is also a much smaller track than what we saw from the hyena earlier, and it's probably because it's on a harder ground. Wild dog tracks typically are not that much smaller than hyenas. They're a lot narrower, though, and a lot less sort of wide and circular than what you see from hyena tracks. So if you have a look here, here is where the pad is at the back. So any of you that have a dog or a cat, if you look underneath their foot, you'll see that they've got little pads. And there is that little back pad. And you can see with this track, the one toes here another toe here and then two toes right in the front and it almost makes like a little Christmas tree so if you kind of put if you had to draw a line down the side on each side you see it's like a little Christmas tree and then the bottom where the pad and the toes are comes along and then this is the pad here so it makes like a little Christmas tree effect and that's how you can kind of re recognize a wild dog track now I'm sure what happened is these wild dogs which are incredible hunters were out and about during the course of the night we have had a situation where we're close to full moon at the moment so the nights are quite bright and that wild dog those wild dogs probably caught that impala and Hosanna being close by and being a bigger bulkier animal ran in and maybe stole it from those wild dogs and then put it up in the tree the tracks go in the direction of where Hosanna is and so I think that's how he got himself a meal it's very interesting because generally leopards are not known to be scavengers but in a case like this where there's other predators around that have meal and and when you have a situation where it's only two wild dogs a leopard being bigger and stronger can muscle in grab it and then go up into a tree so Hosanna was very clever to be able to get into that area and be able to take that for himself Good, well we're going to carry on through these thickets and keep our eyes open. We're constantly looking about and trying to see what there is around us. We're looking for all kinds of small things as well as to just keep our eye out in case there is any leopards or elephants or something like that around. Good, now we're going to keep on moving through and while we do that, let's send you back to Ralph and see where he's going to go now that he's going to be leaving Hosanna. Well, everyone, I've just come down near to a little water hole, and look what we've managed to find. This is an antelope, and it's a boy, and he's got nice big horns and a beautiful coat with long white hair all the way on the top and little white stripes down the side 
and he's also got a white stripe on his face there, a little bit like an American football player. Hey, you can put on those stripes just below your eyes. And this is called an Anyala. Now, Savannah, uh, thanks for your question, and you want to know how we stay safe. Well, Savannah, we understand and we respect all the wild animals out here, so we know which animals are dangerous and when they are dangerous by watching them and the way that they react to us. So we just watch them and we know when they're angry with us and we'll maybe just then get out of their way like this uh, male Nyala that's making his way now. He was a little bit angry with that other uh, Nyala a minute ago, and I think it's because uh, maybe he came a little bit too close to his girlfriend. And uh, now that we're down next to the water, there's all sorts of little creatures that like to stay in the water, and one of them is a beautiful reptile. I've got a very lovely reptile now starting to open the mouth. A small baby crocodile just got out of the hole now. Look at that. So the crocodile is just basking the sun now. So, but to the crocodiles, the sun is a matter of survival. These are part of the reptiles. So reptiles, they depend on the energy from the sun in order to survive the body. Since they, they, they don't convert a lot of food into energy like we do. So crocodiles, they are carnivores, meaning that they have got to depend on hunting. They hunt and kill other animals for their survival. So look at that mouth open. This is quite very beautiful. Look at that. So the crocodiles and the hippopotamus are sharing the same place. They are all staying together. So that is the male trying to demarcate his territory. He is trying to mark his place. So how it works here by the dam. So how it works here by the dam is very much interesting. There is something called a territory. So a territory is just a small piece of land where the animals are marking to say, this is my place, I am staying here with my family, and I don't want problems. So what that animal was doing now, he was trying to mark his place. So the crocodiles and hippos don't fight because they don't compete for anything. So, uh, Belia, I, I'm not too sure about the kind of signs from the hippos showing happiness. So it's some of those things that I've got to research and see because it's quite a very difficult animal to read. So I'm going to have to check a lot of different behaviors so that I can count and see when they're happy. When they're not happy, I know, but when they're happy, it's difficult to tell. So you can see the hippopotamus, they don't mind the crocodiles. Also the crocodiles don't mind the hippopotamus. They are all staying in harmony because they don't compete for the same kind of food. This very relaxed hippopotamus is a herbivore, only feed on vegetation. And the crocodiles, they feed on meat, so they don't compete for anything. So that is why they can stay together. Look at that. Naliki, the crocodiles, they've got a very low survival chance. The big birds, such as the fish eagles, 
and other kind of eagles, they take the crocodiles. Fish eagles, they take them a lot. So those are some of the things which are controlling the population of the crocodiles in the wild. So hippopotamus are not part of the predators. But also, the cats, such as the leopards, I have seen them, they also hunt and catch the crocodiles. The fully grown one, they can be able to go and swim and follow the crocodiles and catch them. Crocodiles are also very much powerful, but the leopards can defeat them. So now uh, we can go to a Christian and see what he's got on the other side. Well, I've got one of the most amazing creatures that is hard at work. Now, there's many, many things out here that are pretty incredible, but none more so to me than the termites. And so that's what we're busy watching now. We're watching a group of termites that are busy feeding ferociously as they go. Now, what we have is essentially a ball of elephant dung. So there's a massive ball that has been dropped by an elephant, and elephants eat mostly vegetation. So we've got a situation where they're eating bits of grass, bits of branches, roots, bark, all of those kind of things. And the thing with an elephant is that it has a very bad digestive system. So we have a situation where the ellies themselves, when they drop their ball of dung, there's still a lot of things that can be eaten inside there. They only digest a very small portion of how much they consume. And so for things like termites, it's actually a really interesting sort of food source because most plant materials contain certain cells inside them that is very difficult for the termites to break down or for insects to break down. And so once it passes through the stomach of an elephant or another animal, that helps already start that breaking down process. And it becomes easier for the termites to actually feed off it. Plus, it's a very easy way to get the food that they need. The elephants go and they get everything for the termites and they deposit it in one little place and it's like going to a supermarket to go and get all your favorite foods or oh, actually in fact you don't even have to go to the supermarket because generally it's delivered on your doorstep and you can actually see that that is the case here so I'm sitting on the top of a termite mound currently and so the elephant has basically delivered a food parcel right to the termites door and so the termites will then try and get as much of the food from this um, elephant dung and then incorporate it into the termite mound which is what all this soil is on the edges of the um, of the dung itself and then they'll try and build their mound almost around it and utilize as much of the food as possible now what you can also see is that there is actually a massive war taking place here so inside this now that the termites are out and about you can see that there are ants that are trying to actually kill the termites so if you look there's going to be little dark ants that are inside there here's a good one here David if you can See, there's a little ant, and it's actually attacking the termites at, at there as we speak. And so what's happening is these termites are all the worker termites, and the soldier termites are much bigger and stronger, and they've got very sharp pincers and can spray a thing called formic acid. And they're not at around at the moment, so they'll come soon. As soon as the termites are under attack, they'll release a pheromone, and those soldier termites will come to try and protect them. But in the meantime, the ants are going to try and raid this and try and get as many termites as they can. And ants are incredible animals. They're probably one of the most ferocious predators that we have out here. We often think about lion and leopard and wild dogs and all of these kind of things that hunt down other animals, but actually termite, uh, ants are the ones that are really probably the most ferocious of them all. They work together as a unit and they'll often take things that are much, much bigger than what they are. So you can see these ants are very small in comparison to the termites, but yet they're able to overpower them because they use each other as, as basically a force to be reckoned with. And much like a gang, they surround their target and then they try and grab it and carry it off it's really quite something to see and it can be a little bit difficult to watch because the poor termites are pretty much defenseless defenseless and so you've got a situation where you know the ants just run in and it's an absolute buffet for them so the elephant has attracted the termites and the termites have then in turn attracted the ants So, Abigail, yes, the termites will lay eggs. Inside here, they will have a whole bunch of eggs that have been laid. So what we have in a termite mound, and behind us is actually a really good example of this, is a huge, huge, huge termite mound. So if you look here, this is how big the termite mounds can be. So I'll go and stand up on here. I'm quite a large fella. I've got 
I'm about six foot two, so I'm a very, very tall person. And it means that this is massive. So this is where the termites live. Inside here is a queen termite, so a big termite that lays lots and lots of eggs every single day. And she will produce them. And as she produces, so other eggs are hatching. And workers and soldiers and reproductive termites are all being selected by pheromones in her body. And basically, as she lays eggs and more workers are produced, so the termite mound gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And they'll do that normally in the summer months so when we've got a bit of rain it's easier for the termites to dig and to get particles of soil and then they bring the particles of soil up and they'll put it on the edge of the surface and they'll mix it with their saliva and their poo and then they'll make like a concrete and you can see if I walk on here that it's incredibly strong so things like elephants and buffalo that weigh a lot they can even walk on here and they won't damage this so it goes to show you just how amazing it is now right on the top you'll notice that there is this big structure so this is the chimney of the termite mound and this is where they are able to control the temperature now it's winter at the moment here in South Africa and that means that the afternoons and the evenings and the nights are very very cold and so it's all closed up at the moment in the summer months what you'll see is that they'll open this up and this will be a vent for the heat and all the heat will actually come out and if you come here and you actually touch this mound it's very very hot it feels much warmer than the ground down below and so that's all the heat that's inside here that's keeping the termites nice and warm during the night absolutely amazing well from one of our most sophisticated animals I'm going to carry on and see what else we can find in the meantime and send you back across to Ralph and see where he's gotten to. Well, everyone, I'm driving backwards. Uh, well, not just because it's fun to do that, but because also we have found the largest land mammal. And what is that? Can you tell me what the largest land mammal is? Come on, kids, send your answers in. What is the largest animal that stays on land? I'm going to now get us in here a little bit and so that we can see them a little bit better. But I want you to give your answers. What is the largest animal that we have here? Come on, kiddies. He's so big, but he can still hide so well in the bushes. Let's go through here and see if we can find him. Now, what's the answer? Come on. Come on, where is he? He's hiding behind the tree. He's a little bit shy, but maybe it's just because it's hot and he wants to get some shade. There he is. He's just in there behind the tree. Let's just see if we can get a little... Oh, look, he's rustling the bushes. You to tell me the answer, because look there through the bushes. What animal is that? Oh! <gasps> Come on, kiddies, what's the answer? This animal is not going to show himself until you tell me what he is. He's got a trunk. See there? There's a trunk. Now, what animal has a trunk? And I bet he's got very big ears as well. A little bit difficult to see them through here. Ah, Samston, you say that it's either a giraffe or an elephant. Well, does a giraffe have a trunk? Hmm, I don't think so. And does a giraffe have tusks like we're seeing there? Those little white, well, very big white things. Oh, it's an elephant! So, Samston, yes, you are right, but it is an elephant. A giraffe is the tallest uh, mammal or animal, but the elephant is the heaviest and the biggest of all. But these ones just hiding in the bushes here a little bit. Maybe they won't be so shy in a minute, and maybe I can go around and see them from the other side. But that was a nice way to first see them. Look how he's shaking the bushes. He's, uh, I think he's just getting himself some lunch, eating some of those lovely green leaves and branches. See, rustling the bushes there. 
Okay, so I'm going to go around the other side and see if he's not so shy from a different angle. And while I'm getting a better view, let's uh, go and have a look at a, another antelope. Well, indeed, Ralph, we've got ourselves another antelope, and you'll see that I'm talking a little softer, and that's because out here, when you're on foot, a lot of the animals are quite scared of people, and they'll be very, very nervous if there's a lot of noise and will run away. And you can actually see the difference between being on a car and being on foot is that the animals are far more aware of our presence. And so we've got a situation where the impalas are quite far from me. I mean, we're probably, I would say, maybe about 100 hundred meters away from where the animals are at the moment and yet they've already picked up our presence. If I was in a vehicle and I'd driven past here like Ralph or Sydney, you'd find that those impalas would not have stopped feeding, they wouldn't have even taken any notice. But because I'm on two legs, they are hardwired to think that people are predators and therefore they're far more alert as to what's going on. So they stop their feeding and they're going to look in my direction, their ears, their eyes focused here and to check what I'm doing. If I walk closer towards them, you're going to find that they're all going to start running away. So it's very very different to being in a car and it's why in foot you've got to be so much more careful about what you're doing you've got to really pay attention and you've got to use all of the things around you to make sure that you don't surprise some of the more dangerous animals like elephants and buffalo and lions by just walking too fast and too quickly and making a lot of noise so it's important when you're out here is to always try and walk slowly and carefully keep your noise level down and listen to what's going on and when you do see animals like this it's to try and respect their space and not to get too close because obviously if we get too close then we're going to disturb them and they're going to run away and we don't want that so I'm going to probably just move off slowly because we don't want to chase these impalas they are happily feeding down in the drainage line and they really are beautiful animals they're our most common antelope that we see here and so we see lots and lots and lots of them and they actually are one of my favorites they really have a beautiful color on them and because they're so common, you get to see them quite a lot, which is quite nice. Good, we're going to move away from them slowly. We're going to keep moving, keep seeing what we can find. While we do that, let's send you back across to Sydney. I have got um, a very quiet place at the moment here where I am. My update, oh, I've got something very much interesting now here. And next to me, I can see some other birds are trying to catch some of the insects. It has been very much quiet here where I am. So I've got some birds that are following a group of impalas. So look at that. A beautiful see these kind of birds they are going after the impalas as if they are managing the impalas feeding whereas these birds are just catching insects and feed while these impalas are going around here but impalas they also get benefits from these birds uh, because when there is any predator a predator is an animal that hunt and kill other animals when they are predators birds can give kind of alarm calls and assist these kind of animals so there is a good relationship amongst birds and animals so the bird that we just saw now i didn't manage to see it very well but it was like a a, a fly catcher if not the fox tail drongo Look at what that animal was doing. Uh, he just had his mouth open now. He was just trying to take some of the information from the air. Not too sure what he was looking for. Let's see. Maybe he's going to do the same again now. So now uh, let's go to Ralph and see what Ralph has got on the other side. Well, here we have, uh, while we're trying to get closer to the elephants and a better view of them, we just spotted this pretty little bird, and this is called a kingfisher. You see his very sharp bill? Normally, these little birds catch fish, but this one, he doesn't catch fish. He actually catches little insects. So that's what he's looking for now from his little perch. He's looking for something that moves in the grass. And then he'll fly down and he'll grab it and fly back up to his perch where he will then gobble it down. Um, so he's a little bit like that leopard, but uh, the bird form, and where he's going to fly around and hunt all sorts of little insects. 
from grasshoppers to locusts and and uh, termites, all sorts. But he is a pretty little bird, isn't he? He's got the lovely blue tips to his wings and a very red bill as well. But he's very concentrated. I think he might have spotted something down there. Oh, he just did a little poo. Oh, and he opened his mouth for us as well. But he's really concentrating. See that? Wow. A very pretty little bird. I'm hoping that he's going to fly down soon and catch something that we might actually see it. Oh, there he goes. Has he flown off? Is he going to come back? Let's just see. I see him flying around on the other side. Okay, well, let's carry on and head back towards where those elephants were. I'll just have a look and see if that kingfisher's not through on the other side. Maybe he caught an insect. Maybe he's busy eating it. Let's just go and have a look. I can also... There he is. There he is. Yes, he did catch something and he's just swallowed it down. There he is. You see him just through the bushes there. That's it. He just swallowed it. Wow. Very clever little birdie, isn't he? That was very cool. Hey? Eh? He's a very good fisherman and hunter. Now, Valia, thanks for your question. These little kingfishers, they'll make a hole in the ground, but normally on the side of a river, or like where we are now, this is a dry river. You see here, he'll make a hole in the side of the, of the soil, and he makes a little hole, and then he goes inside, something like that, over there. Okay, he'll make a little hole there, and then he makes a, a nice little nest inside the hole. So that's where the kingfishers make their nests. They don't make their nests in trees. They'll make it in the side of a bank in the sand. So they are a little bit different to the other birdies. But they are very, very pretty and special, aren't they? And he's a very good hunter. Very concentrated. You do need to be if you're going to catch your food. Not just like going down to the shop and buying a hamburger, is it? He's got to catch his food, so he needs to be very, very fit. And he needs to have good eyes. And he has to have a sharp bill. There he goes again. Oh, He's just flown to another branch. That's it. Wow, he's really showing us now. I'm sad we missed him eating that little insect. But he is very pretty. So I'm just waiting for him to fly off and then I'm going to move forward and we try to find these elephants again. And that's going to be awesome. And maybe the elephants will even go down for a drink. But it seems like I'm not the only one that's found another bird. I've got a very beautiful plover. The uh, just two, one of them is uh, very far away now. These are some of those birds that prefers to nest on the ground. Not all, not all the birds are nesting up by the trees. Some of them, they come and make nest on the ground, and then that is where they are going to hide their eggs. And then some of them, they go high up trees, they build nest, and when they build their nest there, they are going to lay eggs up by the trees. So these birds are some of those birds that help us too much. When we are going out every day, we rely on them because they have got nests on the ground. If animals are walking towards their nest, you will hear them giving a lot of alarm calls. They don't, they get very easily upset when animals are moving towards their nest. So they can be able to tell you that, no, in this area, there's something going past my nest, come and check. So we rely on them. They are good indicators of what is happening in the area. Especially in the mornings when cats are still very much active. 
And if you see their eggs, they are very much shaded. It's not easy to identify them. The eggs are very much camouflaged. So by camouflage, I'm referring to the fact that these bears, their eggs, they match their surrounding. So they are just going to look as the grass or going to look as the type of soil which is in that area. So to single out an egg from this kind of beds is going to take you time. It happened to me before. I was looking just to see how the eggs look like. It took me days and days. And the day I found them, it took me even more than two and a half hours in order to find one. So now I will just be going towards east of the uh, park at the game reserve and see what we are going to see. And uh, now is the time for me to say goodbye. It has been very much great having me here in this kind of a program. And thank you very much for your questions and your comments. Let's meet again tomorrow at 3 o'clock. Well, hello and welcome back to all our regular viewers. Um, we are coming to you live from the Juma Traverse in the Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa. And please don't forget to send us your questions and your comments on the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and on the YouTube live chat. And get involved in our interactive Sunset Game Drive Safari. And I've managed to catch up with this little um, breeding herd of elephants. Not quite sure how many there are around. We're down now in the Mlawati, and we can see quite a few individuals, but I'm sure uh, with the rustlings of trees and branches in the bushes, there's a lot more that we can't see. And it seems like there's quite a few sort of youngsters around here as well. There seem to be a few young males, so I don't know if this is just the stragglers at the end or at the back end of a herd and maybe making their way slowly towards the twin dams. Now Michelle and Ravinder, uh, I'm also excited as you are that we found elephants. I always love being around elephants, especially breeding herds when they're relaxed and they're feeding and carrying on. And I can tell you up ahead here, these uh, it's not the best view for you guys, but these um, these elephants are really getting stuck into this apple leaf up ahead of us. They're really pulling it back. I wonder if they might be pulling it over in a second. I don't want to go right below them because it's not always great to be directly be below an elephant. If they, if they do then decide that they want to come down that bank, they might land up running straight into us. So that's the reason I've just sort of stopped a little bit further away um, and just waiting to see what they do because it looks like there is one very big elephant there um, but uh, well we'll just wait and see what they do and hopefully I'll get a better view of a very big individual there in between the trees and it seems like he's not the only one in between the trees no, Ralph, he is not the only one in the trees. I'm also just negotiating my way through a few thickets. We've dropped down into the Mulawati as we try and see if we can maybe try and find some signs of, well, Tingana, Tandi and Tlalamba, or any elephants that we can find. Now, it is a warm welcome to all of the viewers that have just joined us and for the regular part of our show. Hopefully you guys will ask lots of questions. Hashtag Safari Live if you do. And actually, funny enough, there's a track for a leopard right there. It's not a very fresh track, but there is a track for Tingana, or I think it's Tingana. You can see the back of the pad and then the toes coming forward. But these are probably from a few days ago. I remember actually following these tracks, trying to find him a few days ago. Right, well, the plan is, is like I say, is to get into Mawati and see if we can try and find some Ellie's. It's been a long time since I've had Ellie's on foot, so I'm hoping that we can do that. And then, like I say, Hopefully we might even find some sign of a spotty cat. Now, it's unfortunate that I seem like it's every start of the week to be a bearer of bad news at the moment. But there was a situation this morning where somebody sent me a photo of a leopard that was on Hoffman's crossing into Arethusa. Now, that particular leopard 
was Kuchava, and the bad part about it is that it seems as though Kuchava, for some reason, must have lost her cub. And I say that because she's mating with a very shy, skittish male, and they've crossed all the way towards Arethusa, which for her is a very, very, very worrying sign. And so I'm hoping that I'm wrong, but I don't think so. When cats start to mate like that, and they start to move way out of their territories, it's generally a sign that the cub, unfortunately, is gone, which is very, very sad. And, you know, she was doing so well she'd gotten that cub to about six months and obviously I suppose these things do happen and so it seems as though she must have lost it just given the fact that she's so far away from where she normally hangs out now Megs I can't hear you unfortunately so I'm going to try and fiddle David what did Megan say I can link to Ralph oh excellent good I'm going to try and sort out my comms while I do that let's send you back across to Ralph Well, and here we are again with the elephants, and I won't be moving anywhere too fast anywhere, anytime soon because they're starting to come all around us, and so we're getting a little bit blocked in here, but uh, that's one of my favorite things is to be in amongst an elephant herd, and they hold you hostage because if you start your vehicle, you can you give them a bit of a fright, and then, uh, then they'll maybe be a little bit nasty to you. So we'll just sit and enjoy being in amongst them. It's such a privilege. And this one coming down the bank, but there's lots of branches in front. So it's sort of moving them out the way as it goes. Look there. He needs to get those very big branches there out the way. Look how he's putting his ears out. He can hear me talking. So trying to make himself look bigger as he moves through there. A little youngster. Now, Romit, the largest herd of elephants that I've ever seen was in Botswana. And I was sitting on the bank of the Zambezi River. Well, it, it, it's a bit of a backwater there, so they call it the Chobi River. But now they actually realize that it's not a separate river and it's just a backwater of the Zambezi. Um, and we were actually... Uh, going on a houseboat so we were just then uh, off the houseboat on a little island and we were watching these elephants on the opposite bank they were coming um, to a little mud wallow and for about three to four hours we sat on the bank and watched a permanent line of elephants come to the mud wallow throw mud over themselves and then walk into the forest um, and I don't, I'm pretty sure that it wasn't all one herd, but I can't be sure. Um, and those elephants must have numbered um, in close to the thousands. So that's probably the biggest herd or not herd uh, that I've ever seen. And they just kept on moving through, uh, as I say, um, well into the dark. And once the light was gone, they, they were actually still going. Um, so I don't even know when that sort of column of elephants stopped uh, coming past because we then moved on to our little farm fireplace and uh, had our dinner and went to bed and in the morning they were gone so I don't know how many were there were there but uh, that was one of the most impressive lines or amounts of elephants that I've ever seen um, and I've also in Savuti uh, also in Botswana uh, probably in one group uh, where we've driven up to them uh, it was probably in, in the region of about 200 elephants that I saw in one group. So that's, uh, I would have to say then, the largest herd that I've ever seen. But all of the the big herds of elephants that I've seen have, have mostly been uh, in Botswana. And there are a lot of elephants there in the Chobe um, National Park and Savuti and Salinda, Lenyanti, all those parts, lots and lots of elephants. I saw a lot of elephants in Namibia as well, and those are the largest elephants in the world. So if you do want to see the most impressive elephants that you will ever see in your life, um, and those ones go up to eight 
tons whereas these ones here are sort of average i would say between six and six and a half tons whereas those namibian itosha elephants not the not the desert elephants the itosha elephants uh, and and it's a an, a known fact um, of their size uh, they they would probably average seven and a half to eight tons um, they are massive and those are really really impressive to be around all right so as we watch this little guy throw a little bit of dust over himself the mid-afternoon dust bath let's head you on over to sydney with one of the most iconic african birds yeah indeed this is one of the iconic african birds the african eagle's course is associated with africa it's quite a lovely call look at that it is my first sighting to have an african fish eagle nice and closer like this i just hear them calling high up look at that so these birds can see very well and they can be able to even see underwater so but if you can check the birds the positioning of their eyes is correlated with their habit the birds that are hunting these other animals including fishing their eyes are right here on the forehead and these small birds if you can check the herbivores the eyes on the small heads they are on the side birds they can see way better than mammals because the skull of the bird is much more there in order to accommodate the eyes and the skull for the predators uh, the mammals uh, apart from predators mammals in general the skull is there just to support the size of the big brain so birds can be able to increase the size of the eyes they can see very well let me just give you an example a hawk can see even seven times more than we do an owl can see on dim light ten times than we do you can see that this kind of of animals are well well much gifted so these birds can be able to fish and they can see underwater from very much far look at that that's quite a beautiful bird uh, rosinda the call for the african fish eagle is like whoo, 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 whoo. but they flayed that like So that is the call they make. So I wish he can give us a call. Uh, Safari South, the African fish eagle can go up to 3.6 kilograms, the adults. So the weight is ranging somewhere there. It's quite a very big bird. Look at that, that uh, hook beak. So most of these big birds. So Catherine, yes, that is very true. The eagles, they are very much um, graceful and they have got a very interesting behavior. They are also doing this thing of partners for life. Most of the eagles, they are monogamous. Look at that color, that white color there. I think his kind of diet is helping him for survival because this bird, if he was to hunt, it was going to be difficult because of that bright color. It was always going to spoil hunting. It's good that these birds are just fishing underwater so these fish cannot be able to see them.
beautiful. You can see he's trying to stretch the but how he's closing his foot, you can see that that foot is quite a very big instrument. Uh, Rosalind, the fish eagles, they come here by the dams not for drinking purposes. They come here for diet. You will see them circling up in the sky when they are looking underwater. The name fish eagle derived from how he is, he is uh, surviving. These kind of birds, they rely on fish. They eat fish. So they are one of the piscivores. Piscivores are the animals. Piscivores are the animals. Are the animals that are hunting. The mating. I just got something interesting to show you. They have got the 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 water monitors. They are just mating. So you can see I've, I'm just lucky to come across the water monitors. They are just mating uh, at the moment. It's something very rare to see. Look at that. You see, they are just crawling with their tongues in and out. So when the tongues are going in and out like that, is when they are using the tongue for navigation and orientation. So they are right on the edge there. This is something very interesting. So they nearly fell off. This is the first time I'm seeing the water monitors mating. Christy is lovely. To me as well, it's the first time I'm seeing this kind of reptiles mating. It's an ornament. I'm so very lucky. So things like this in my culture has got a meaning. So this means that I am going to be very lucky. So there will be something good coming towards my direction. I'm just not sure what it is, but it is going to happen. And I will share with you when it happens. Look, there's another one approaching. Let's just see what that other one is coming to do. The third one. So they're just moving, keep moving. Yeah, polar, their tails are so very much long and these tails have them for balance when they're swimming. This is something very special. I never saw this happening before. And I'm not too sure if the crocodiles will get problems with this kind of uh, of reptiles when they are mating. But yes, when they are mating like this, you can see that they can easily get predated because their whole concentration is on mating. 
So I'm just very much interested to see what this one is going to do. But that tongue is telling this one that these two in front are mating. And this is how it works. When the tongue is in and out, it's taking information from the air particles and transfer it to the roof of the mouth where they've got a special organ called a Jacobson organ. Then it will be transferred from the Jacobson organ to the roof of the mouth where there is a special brain called hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus will inform this rival about everything that is happening there. Let's just see what this one is. Let's just see what this one is up to. You can see that uh, mating on this kind of reptiles, this takes time. I have never seen something like this before. Look, the other one is also now coming to add. What's happening here? Just look at that. So you can see that those two, the partners who are mating, cannot even defend themselves because the other one is coming and none of them is reacting. No retaliation, nothing. And these kind of reptiles are carnivores. Look at that. Just want to try and see what the third one is trying to do. The third one is interested to join, you can see. This is quite a lovely sighting. So the, this is clear that the one which is coming there, who is now coming to add a number, might be... Oh, now they're, now they're, they're leaving us now. So the third one disturbed the activities. They look like baby crocodiles. So, Michelle, yeah, it was quite very much awesome. Uh, we were very, very much lucky. Let me just see what that one is coming back to do. Maybe it's coming back again uh, to continue. So I'm not too sure if the one who ran away earlier was a, a, a female. So things are just happening, you can see. They are very lovely much. Uh, they are very, very lovely lizards. Beautiful how they walk, how they, they crawl is very much interesting. Yeah, it seems like uh, these two are just oh, it's slowly approaching again, slowly approaching. Just trying to find out what this one is up to. This is interesting. Look at them. The 
other one is keep following. So you can see that the one in front is not interested to stop there. Let's see where this is gonna end. So now um, let's go to Ralph and see what Ralph is doing on the other side. I will just wait a little bit and see what is going to happen here. Well, everyone, look at this tiny little baby. He is so cute. Very, very young. Can't be much older than a couple of months at the most. I would say two, two, maybe, maybe three months, maybe less. Very young. Look at that. He's still probably trying to work out what is this thing hanging in front of my face. This trunk, look at it. It's like... It really is like a fire hydrant that's uh, under pressure. It doesn't know which way to point it. And they've always got like this little bit of a bodyguard system around when there's a small little youngster like that. Do the elephants. This one obviously stepping in front, almost going, who are you looking at, my little brother or sister? Oh, and he's even going to maybe give us a little bit of a head shake. Oh, the little one coming over. Look at that, and they're so obliging and standing in the road for us. Look at the little youngster coming in there. It looks like it's trying to... It's trying to suckle from that one, but I don't think that that's the mother at all. I think it's just going for that. Now, I hear there was a question uh, if there's any difference between the African elephants and the Indian elephants. Yes, there is. These elephants, uh, and that's Mr. P, these elephants get much bigger than the Indian elephants and a little bit of a different shape as well. The Indian elephants seem to have a much more rounded head um, than these do and their ears are also much smaller, or their ear flaps, also much smaller. Now, is this the mother? If this is the mother, it's a very young one. I thought it was that much bigger female there. And she's definitely trying to have a drink there, but... Oh, look at the little baby going down on its haunches. That is very cute. Maybe it is this female's baby. Very interesting. And the other one has come right in there, sort of as a guard. Oh, this baby is now trying to drink. I thought it was that big female's baby which i do i think i'm right i don't think that this baby is drinking from the right person there i think it's just uh, naturally trying to drink from anybody i don't think it's having much success maybe that's how they, they do practice a little bit now, Deborah, you say you, you can't get cuter than this. I would have to uh, agree with you wholeheartedly because I do find elephants fascinating. I really love being in their presence. And to have a little baby like this, how precious. That is very, very precious indeed. And they're all milling around. Some of them still feeding a bit. It's like these young females here. Yeah, it's almost like little girls playing with their dolls, I think. Now, our Laura Moore, I don't think it's an orphan baby. I think, as I say, sometimes, you know, it's like, you know, maybe teenage girls, or not teenage girls, more the younger girls playing with their dolls and their Barbies and, um, you know, playing with the, the little kids as well, but often pretending to be mommies. And, and, well, it's also good practice for later in life. I don't think that that is the mother that it was trying to drink from. It's gone over now to the real mommy, the big female over there that's uh, i'm pretty sure who the mommy is she's got very swollen mammary glands as well so i'm almost positive that that is where it's gone now over to real mom and there was quite a bit of communication there as well when the little one was sort of sandwiched in by those three younger females and i wonder if they were busy telling each other about this little baby look at that 
Now it's coming over to the next one and trying... See that? It's letting it. You can hear the sort of attempts at sucking as well now. That's very, very interesting that, eh? Going over to the other females and trying to have a drink. You see now, now it's walking next to mom. I'm sure of it. Those younger females now, I think, fighting over, trying to be the pseudo mom for a for 10 minutes. As so they start to move through, still got quite a few elephants around us. Lots of sort of a couple of years old. And so, well, at least we've got the safety of the vehicle here, which allows us to get nice and close to these elephants. But out on foot, obviously, uh, it wouldn't be as easy. Well, it is completely different, Rolf, and we've managed to kind of get on the side of an elephant herd, and I'm not sure if it's the same herd Rolf has got. We're just in the Milwaukee system at the moment. We spotted these guys on one of the banks, and so we've kind of used the bank to our advantage and gotten as close as we probably can. There's not too much cover from where they are and to where we are. In fact, we've got a very spindly bush that we're sitting behind, and so Rolf thinks that we are in the same herd, which is quite interesting. I didn't realize that Rolf was down this way, but anyway, it was nice just to kind of see. We were trying to get across towards where Tandy was last seen and kind of bumped into these guys as we went. But what's interesting is that there is a big individual that's quite close. So just behind these bushes that are just straight through there, those quarry bushes, there's an individual that should come out towards where we are, which will be quite nice because we're in a perfect place if it does come out of that thicket that it will be well in really nice proximity to where we are and it's amazing to be with Ellie's on foot it's one of my absolute favorite things to do is to find a safe little spot and just to watch and listen and observe these gentle giants so Kimberly you're wondering my favorite thing about bushwalk well this is one of them I think walking elephants has got to be probably up there is one of my ultimate things to do in, in terms of being out in the bush, I absolutely love, like I say, spending time with these animals. It's so peaceful if you're on foot. If you get yourself into a nice place and you get into a safe area where you just watch them and listen to them and see them going about their feeding, it's a very, very, very surreal experience. So that's probably one of my favorites. And the other thing about bushwalk that I really love is that you get into be able to see things that you probably miss when you drive. It's a, you feel a lot more immersed in nature. You feel as though you're a bit more connected to what's actually going on. And it becomes a, a sort of a, a much more multi sense um, experience where your eyes, your ears, your nose, everything kind of becomes engaged. Whereas on a vehicle, you know, you use your eyes a lot and you, you use your ears, but it's not the, quite the same thing as being on foot. You kind of connect a lot more with nature when you're on foot. You, you feel as though you're a part of the system rather than just being an observer in the system. And that's for me is absolutely amazing. And to be able to kind of utilize that to, to see all the different little things that we get to see out here in terms of animals and plants and insects is absolutely amazing so my favorite thing is, is probably that, that is that you know you get this ability to connect with nature now I was saying just now that these guys there should be one Ellie that was hopefully going to come out very very close to us but I think it might have changed course I can still hear it feeding fairly close by it sounds as though it's just general somewhere in that general direction and I was hoping that it would just come out into this little clearing because we would have been in the absolute perfect spot if it does move in this direction so we'll just be patient and wait and see it's pretty cool just hearing them actually on foot you know we've obviously got Rex that's looking after us and making sure that we're nice and safe and we don't really have the, the probably the best place but the wind is right for us and we're in a situation where we're at least somewhat kind of hidden and the Ellie's have absolutely no idea that we're here and that's the sort of six key to having a successful walk in my opinion is to try and get in and watch these animals and observe them and get out without them noticing you is probably the best thing that you can possibly do so I'm thoroughly enjoying the fact that we've got ourselves into this situation and hopefully we'll get rewarded with a nice clear view of one of the Ellie's as we go right now while we sit with these big giants and we try and see if we can Oh, you can see Ralph. Well done. There he goes, Ralph, driving through. You can just see his antenna as he goes. But like I say, we'll sit with these Ellie's a little while longer, see if they're going to emerge from the thicket. And while we do that, let's send you back across to Sydney and his ever-interesting monitor lizard. I am still here and... and not much is happening at the moment. It's a, a bird which is trying to charge a monitor passing by. 
So I think it's a dick up there. It's trying to charge. The monitor was coming to pass, and I could see that bird was spreading the wings, trying to look big in order to scare the monitor. So not much is happening now. The monitors decided to... I can't see it very well, but I think it's a decop. That bed is one of my, uh, on the ground, is one of my interesting beds. You will mostly see this kind of beds uh, very close to the crocodiles. When the crocodiles open the mouth, they go there and pick up the piece of meat stuck by the teeth. So they act like dentists to the crocodiles. So crocodiles, they do get a very good benefit from staying much closer to these kind of beds. So that is a kind of relationship which is called a mutualism because both crocodile and this bed, they are getting benefit from that kind of an exercise. So now I am just going to try and move on here and see if I can find uh, other interesting things. So those... Uh, water monitors, they have decided to relax now. Nothing is happening at this stage. You can see the, the other ones are trying to pick up the sand, so that is where things were happening. So it means there might be some kind of pheromones sent from the mating activities. Uh, Metron, the uh, water monitors, they do lay eggs and they mostly target the uh, termite mound. And if they don't target termite mounds, they must have to dig a hole whereby the sun is going to create warm enough. So they mostly go and lay up to 40 to 50 eggs inside the termite mound and abandon the eggs. So the temperature which is created by those insects, termites, will then help to incubate those eggs. Yeah, it has been a great, great afternoon with those uh, monitors. So now I'm going to have to move on and see if I can find you uh, more other uh, interesting wonders of the world. So these kind of uh, reptiles, they are oviparous, so it means they are egg-laying animals. So they just like birds. So let me now see if I can find something. I'll be driving now towards the western side from east of the game reserve. Well, everyone, that's uh, almost what I'm doing. But what I'm doing now is I'm just driving to Treehouse Dam because those elephants are sort of making their way from them little up in this direction towards Treehouse Dam. And I'll just wait there a little bit and see if they come on over because it's always wonderful to watch elephants when they come through to drink, especially when there's little babies around and they start playing around and all of that. But I'm not going to wait there too long because they were feeding and taking their time about it. So I might be here all afternoon uh, if they carry on at the pace that they were going. Uh, so we'll just see. Now, proud cap mama. Uh, good question. Do elephants um, play a big role in, in um, uh, maintaining a biodiversity? Absolutely. They can play a big role in maintaining it. They can also play a big role in um, breaking it down. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, they, they can definitely keep uh, the area clear when there's uh, species such as your red bush willows, your sickle bush, uh, and even more piney, uh, which are real bush encroachers, and they can um, sort of eliminate uh, other species of plants and then really um, uh, draw that uh, biodiversity or, or, or squeeze it. Um, and the elephants just help keeping those areas open. Um, and also when they're pushing those trees over, feeding on them uh, and clearing the areas, it does also then make that, that uh, vegetation available um, 
to all sorts of other little creatures, uh, you know, from arthropods to birds uh, and, and all sorts. Um, so, uh, the, yes, absolutely, they keep the areas open. But, you know, like, for instance, what is happening now in, um, in Botswana, uh, they're having a real you know uh, i don't know how to put it not a problem well it is a problem but uh, it's bigger than a problem because um you know they haven't been and, and this don't get me wrong in this um they, they, they've uh, taken the policy of no culling of the elephants um which is a good policy to make but the result is that they've got a massive overpopulation of elephants, especially in the Chobe um, National Park. And so these elephants are really having a massive impact on the environment. And, you, and you're landing to, uh, you know, moving towards almost desertification of the entire um, areas that those uh, massive herds of elephants are moving through. Now, traditionally, uh, obviously, uh, and hi historically, uh, they would have been able to migrate, um, but now they're not able to do that anymore. You've got the veterinary fences, and you've got, you know, Botswana almost cut in half, and then you've got Namibia um, and Zimbabwe and, and, and Mozambique, etc. So the real migratory paths of these um, animals that would have been able to take place uh, historically is no more. So when you've got massive numbers of these elephants now confined into a space, uh, you know, the size of, of Savuti and Chobi and, um, and, and those areas, they're starting to have a lot of problems now. And what, what is the solution? You can't really move elephants, not easily anyway, uh, because you need pretty much a truck per animal. So when you're talking of, uh, you know, 20 or 30,000 elephants too many, over your carrying capacity, um, you're, you're talking about a massive problem. Now there's a little Daker that of course won't stand still for us when he uh, sees us and off he goes at true Daker speed, diving through the bushes, as his name suggests, and there's not too much down here for the minute. So what the answer is with those um, overpopulated uh, populations there in Botswana, uh, I don't know because, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that it's a very nice thing or, or uh, a real conclusive idea to be just uh, culling elephants. Um, look, you know, as a, as a naturalist or a guide for many, many years, uh, I do take the emotion out of things. And when talking of hunting, poaching, culling, all of these kind of things, yes, um, I know that uh, there is a lot of emotion around it. But when I talk of what I think uh, should be done and so on, it's not it's not an emotional response. Um, you're thinking about a problem and a solution. So with that, you know, at some stage they're going to have to make a, a solution there with those elephants because otherwise you're going to have massive um, die-offs of, of elephants anyway. So whether you start um, putting them out of their misery before the problem escalates to the point where you're going to have a total collapse of the biodiversity in the area, um, it, you know, it's, it's down to management and it's down to the conservationists in Botswana to decide. But, um, you know, I think that uh, a bit of a more hands-on um, management style is sometimes mostly called for when you've got a protected area or an enclosed area. Uh, so I'm inclined to lean uh, towards the culling side of things and that might put me in the bad books of, of lots of people, but I don't care. Um, it's, uh, it's about the animals and the wildlife and the biodiversity and everything included. So if you don't like what I say, well, that's, um, that's unfortunately uh, a difference of opinion. Well, Ralph, we are sitting now in amongst these ellies and we've found ourselves the perfect spot and I'm super excited because we've got ellies all around us at the moment and basically what we've done is we've gotten up onto a nice big termite mound just on the northern side of where the ellies are and they're slowly but surely feeding their way towards us. Now, I am whispering because, well, the closest elephant I would imagine from where I am right now is less than 50 meters, in fact about 40 meters away. And they are slowly heading this way. It is so cool to be this close to them. And they have absolutely no idea that we're here. We managed to use the sun as well as the wind as, and thickets. And we've got ourselves into the most perfect termite mound. It's got a nice steep slope to it, so they're not going to worry us up here. Ellies, if you're up on a mound, generally are not too worried about your presence. And so you can get away with being up in these thickets. And so hopefully we're going to have a really good time with these guys. And they should 
theoretically come really close, but isn't this just so cool? Oh, this is one thing that I missed when I was in the Maros. Being on foot with the Elies of the, the Kruger National Park, it's a very, very special thing to be able to do. You can see they're slowly coming now. There's a few little babies in here, and I'm hoping there's one tiny little one that I hope is going to make an appearance somewhere in that little section. It went behind a bit of a thicket, but I'm pretty sure it will come out at some point. We've got such a nice view of where they are, and there's a pathway that runs just on our sort of left side and Ellie's have been using it for the last few days you can see lots of Ellie tracks there and so I think that they're going to kind of use that exact path and come right past us which is going to be fantastic the other nice thing is that the wind is in the perfect kind of direction the wind is blowing from the elephants to us and sort of a little bit more to our right side or the right of those Ellie's and so they shouldn't actually pick us up through the breeze we should have a situation where we're okay but very very cool to see isn't this just amazing? I absolutely love doing these kind of things. Like I said, for me, this is the best thing that I can do on a bushwalk, is just to find a spot like this. You've got the African sun that is just starting to set beautiful lights and a whole big herd of Ellie's right here. It's absolutely phenomenal. Now, I know many, many people have never experienced this, but it's one of those things, like I say, I was saying earlier, I alluded to it a little bit, that it is a surreal experience. You've got these massive animals, and you really do get a sense of their size when you're sitting on a foot on a termite mound, and they walk up to you, and they're just absolutely peaceful and serene animals, and the way they go about their business is just the most relaxing thing in the world. Oof, see, you know, this depends on how big the elephants are, but you know, if it's a, if it was all say adult males, to demolish a hectare of grass would be very, very quick. Because remember, with elephants, is that they're not small. So what they don't eat, they're going to trample and they're going to, you know, kill that way. And it depends on how long you're leaving them in there for. But it wouldn't take very long. I can tell you that if you confined them onto a hectare and you let them loose, they would destroy it in a very, very, very quick manner. And actually, funny enough, here in South Africa, that's why you cannot keep elephants on any reserves that are smaller than 10,000 hectares. So you have to have 10,000 hectares before you can do an introduction of elephants onto those reserves. And that's why they need that space, is because they just go through so much food and they eat so much, you wouldn't be able to put them in a hectare. They would eat it too quickly and they would then starve. So, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult question to have, give you an exact figure on, because, you know, like I say, is it a male, is it a female, is it young elephants? old elephants or is it a typical group size if it is a typical oh is there the little baby david so david's got the little baby how cute is that <laughs> it's a tiny little one it's very very small it's super super cute <laughs> little baby eddies are the best things ever they are so playful and so kind of happy about life i always enjoy watching them go about their business but very very cool to see like I said, we're just in the best place. It's in The view, obviously, on foot is never going to be what it is on a vehicle, but we really do have a perfect spot. Can you hear that? So that's... So the Ellie's are talking to one another. How cool is that? And look at how they're posturing. So there was a slight disturbance in amongst the herd. Now, I don't think it was us in any way. I, don't, I think it's more a situation than where maybe a young individual maybe got a bit close to the baby, and that caused them to get a little bit on the sort of nervous side. And so everybody comes running in to protect the baby, and you see how they posture. Their ears go out. Their trunk will wave a little bit. They lift one leg, and they'll be communicating to each other through those visual clues. It's absolutely fascinating to watch elephant herds. And like I said, being in, on foot with them and immersed inside the herd, you really get a sense of the little intricate sort of visual cues that they give one another. You know, you often watch Ellie's and you think to yourself, well, they're not really talking to one another and there's no communication going on at all. But actually, there is really a lot that's happening and these guys are constantly giving each other signs, even through little movements of their legs and trunks and their heads. It's really quite cool. And you can see one is also dust bathing in the background there. And it's having a really good dust bath, throwing lots of dust over the back and ears, making sure that they're looking after that skin as best as possible. This is very cool. I wonder how much they're going to move to towards us. I think they might actually get a little closer than what they are already. If they come through this little thicket, they might end up right at the base of this mound, which will be quite something. So we're going to just see how that plays out and whether or not they do get closer. While we do that, let's send you back across to Sydney and see how this afternoon has been panning out.
Yeah, I have just left Chitwa Dam earlier on. I am now coming towards the central part of the game reserve and see if I'm going to find something interesting here. So I've just started my trekking. I haven't picked up any convincing fresh tracks yet, but I hope very shortly I will pick up something. So now I am targeting to find at least a cat. Uh, Apollo, the, the biggest lizard you're going to find in the bush is going to be the rock monitor. We have got the rock monitors and the water monitors. So in water, you are going to find the one that we have just uh, seen earlier on. So when you are out here where I am driving now, you will see another one which looks a little bit similar to the one we have just seen, which is called a rock monitor. <clears throat> Yeah, it's not, not easy to find the tracks at the moment. I can, I can pick up some uh, elephant smell. It seems like there is some elephants here in the area. So the chances for the elephants are very high at the moment. No tracks, nothing, but the sense of smell is telling me that the elephants, they are somewhere here. So now, while I'm looking for the elephants, let's see what my other colleagues are doing on the other side. Well, yes, I'm slowly um, now, well, I got a little bit impatient waiting for the elephants. I think they're moving very slowly uh, on their way towards Treehouse Dam. So um, I'm sure Sydney uh, and Tristan are with um, the same uh, sort of bigger herd that's a bit broken up and spread around uh, in that area around the Milwaukee. So um, I think Sydney is going to make his uh, way slowly in the westerly direction and just check the boundary there, see if the Nkuhuma Pride um, haven't uh, come onto the property, as well as see as, uh, if any of these uh, leopards to our west have made an appearance or made their way onto Juma. So what I'm going to do in the interim is make my way back over to the sleepy Hosanna and see if he's um, getting up to anything. As it gets a little bit darker or later, maybe he'll go for a little drink. I know he went for a drink around midday, but that's not to say he won't go for another one with a very big fat belly like he's got. He might be going for quite regular little slips. So we'll just go on over to him and we can spend, I would say, the most part of the end of the drive just hanging with Hosanna. Uh, it's not such a bad thing to do, is it? Maybe we won't see him tomorrow. Maybe he'll be gone. So we should just uh, be happy with him being around. All right, so while I get on over there towards the Vuyotela Dam, let's head you on back to Tristan with those Ellies on foot. Well, we are still with our Ellie's on foot, and it's just getting better and better. We've had such a beautiful view of them. And I actually think that we should maybe show a few other people on our various platforms just how amazing it can be to be on Ellie's with Ellie's on foot. It really is the most insane thing to be able to do. Now, I'm going to hold, I'm going to refrain from speaking, should I say, for a little bit while we just get everybody on board, and then we'll continue with our epicness. But for now, you guys can just listen to the sound of the Ellie's as they feed towards us.
Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this very, very special scene that is unfolding in front of us. We're currently sitting in the middle of South Africa in amongst, well, the most gentle of giants as a big elephant herd is rolling past us. We are coming to you live from South Africa, which means that this is interactive and that you can ask lots of questions. So just remember, hashtag Safari Live, or you can just post your comments in the section below or questions, and we'll try and answer as many as possible. Now, my name is Tristan. On camera, I've got Dave. And as you can see, why it's so special is because we're not in a car at all. We're on foot, which is just absolutely insane. So we're sitting here. We've managed to get ourselves into a very safe spot. We're on a termite mound. It's got a bit of height. We've got a nice thorn tree above us that's protecting us. And the wind is in the perfect direction. So we've positioned ourselves here in the hope that the Ellie's would feed their way all the way towards where we are. And they're really coming quite close. The lead female at the moment is no more than, I would say, probably about 30 meters away from us. And the reason why we're safe is because not only do we have the sun at our backs, which means the Ellie's are looking straight into the sun the wind is blowing from them to us and we have a situation where we've got a bit of high ground and so they don't even know that we're here and that's the best way to be on foot with the Ellie's it really is just the most spectacular thing to be doing and I, I can't tell you how amazing it is when you're sitting in amongst a herd like this and you're on foot and there's no vehicle around you you really get a sense of not only their size but the power that they have and just the sort of nature of the elephant itself you kind of feel immersed into the herd and the relaxed nature of them really is a special special thing to do so we're hoping that they'll just continue to keep coming past there's lots of babies lots of females and sub adults it is very very cool to see and they're actually coming even closer there's ones that are just coming to our left hand side and they're going to be no more than like i say probably about 15 meters from where we are and the best part like i say is that they're also not really too phased by what's going on they're in a situation where they're still feeding and as long as ellies are still feeding it means that they're not alerted to our presence at all but how extraordinary is this this is just absolutely amazing it is my favorite thing to do on a bushwalk so Karen and Sergio you say wow well Karen and Sergio it doesn't get any better than this for me for me if I'm on foot sitting with elephants like this is just the most special thing and we are so fortunate that everything kind of uh, fell into our favor in terms of the wind and, and the way that the Ellie's were moving that they actually have passed so close to where we are I promise you that they are very very close at the moment and they have no idea that we're here this is so cool Tony, you say such a beautiful animal. Well, yes, they are the most beautiful animals that we have. Well, some of the most beautiful animals. They're an incredible species. They obviously evoke a lot of emotions in us as humans because of, well, their size. Their size makes them a very, very interesting animal. You know, big things often attract a lot of attention, but also just the social complexities of the herd. So you have a situation where you've got a lot of things that are parallel to people. They are, you know, they have young ones that they are very caring for you have a situation where they live in family groups like us as people we like to have family close by and then just their intelligence as well really connects us to them so they're an animal that is highly highly intelligent and that makes them something that we all kind of can relate to and so we we understand a lot of the things that happen with elephants and we really can kind of pick up on their emotions and the way that they do or go about their business and that makes them a very very special animal and it's a reason why a lot of people are absolutely in awe of elephants and why we are in awe of them right now so Sandra if the wind was blowing differently yes they would have smelt us and they wouldn't be very happy about where we are remember with anything out here wild animals perceive people more as a threat than anything else and they have a situation where they are quite nervous of people being around it's hardwired into them after many many years of people persecuting them that the people are quite dangerous and so they would be able to smell us if the wind blew the right direction so what's happening now is the wind is coming from the elephant towards me and so therefore my scent is actually not blowing anywhere near them if they were on the other side of the mound so if they were on the right side of the mound then they would be smelling us and that would be a very different situation you would have found that either the herd would have moved off very very quickly in order to protect those babies or there might have even be a bit of aggressiveness towards us in order to to try and chase us away but there's some Ellie's that are coming right up on our left hand side here there's a tree that we're kind of behind at the moment so you'll see it will be a bit obscured but that elephant is very very close at the moment how cool is this <laughs> this is just absolutely epic my day has been made So, Cynthia, you're wondering where the babies are? Well, there are some babies in amongst them. There's one small baby. I don't know where it's gone now. It's in amongst 
all of the adults, but there are a few that are around sort of five, six years old, some that are as much as 10, 12, and then obviously the adult females. So it's quite a mixed herd. There's no very tiny, tiny, so there's no newborn babies inside here, but there are one or two smaller ones that are around that are between sort of two and three years that are in this herd. You must also remember with elephants is that their birthing rate is quite slow in comparison to, let's say, something like a dog or a cat. You have a situation where Ellie's, because they have such a large calf at birth and they are so developed in terms of the, the sort of anatomy of an elephant in terms of trunks and all these kind of things, that it takes a long time for them to gestate and have a baby. They are pregnant for 22 months before they give birth and then they've still got to suckle that little one. And so the interval between breeding, depending on the, the area that they're in, is normally about four years. And so, you know, sometimes you won't see tiny, tiny little calves within a herd if those females have already had ones and they're, you know, between two and three, then they're not going to have those little ones just yet. But there are babies in amongst this herd. There's not a lot, but there are some that are around. But it's a beautiful sized herd. It's pretty kind of typical for what we would see in this particular area. We normally see herds of, you know, between sort of 15 and 20. Um, that's our common sort of size for this part of the world. Although we can sometimes get herds that go up to 100. So, yeah, and the warning signs of angry elephants are, are very clear. It's quite nice with elephants because they, they show you very quickly that they're upset. And so what would, would be a warning to us? Oh, here come some of the babies. They're coming to greet this individual. There you go, David, on your left-hand side. There we go. So there come some of the little ones. You see them? How cute are they? <laughs> There's a little greeting going on. So, yeah, and sorry, I just got a bit distracted by the little ones. And there comes the tiny one, one of the tinier ones in the background. It's going to come out fairly soon. You'll find in when there's lots of small ones, they actually do hang around in a, like a little nursery group where they play around with each other. But there it comes through the little background area. It's the smallest of the herd and a very playful little individual. How cute is that? <laughs> um, so in the, the warning signs would be a situation where immediately this whole herd would stop feeding so you'd have a situation where everyone stops they will all clump together they'll put the babies into the middle adults on the edges ears will flare out as much as possible so that they can catch as much sound as, as they, they can pick up and the reason that the ears go out for that is because if you cup your ear around your hand around your ear you'll see that you channel sound into the eardrum and it's much easier for you to hear and so they do that then they'll lift their trunk they'll start scenting they'll be a few vocalizers, grumblings that will happy, happen, and then if they pick you up, they'll start to shake their heads. They might even start throwing branches or dust in your direction, and then if you still don't leave and don't get the message, well, then they could even start resorting to, to charges where they'll start to warning charge you. They'll kind of run in ears out, make a big scene, spray dust in your direction, and then if you're really not paying attention, then they're going to come through and actually charge you and, and try and attack you. So the, the warning signs would, would be ears flared, nose trunks up, the herd in a tight-knit unit and no longer feeding. That's what we'd be looking for. But as you can see with this herd, they are completely relaxed. Every single member is feeding. The babies all spread out. So it's a situation where the herd has absolutely no idea that we're even here. It's, it really is quite something to be in amongst eddies like this. We are so, so fortunate to be witnessing this and super spoiled, really, if I'm honest. It's one of those things that you kind of... You have to pinch yourself to, to almost believe it's real when you're sitting in a situation like this. And to be able to share this with all of you around the world is absolutely incredible. It's probably the best part of our job, actually. So, actually, the, the matriarch... Um, it depends. I mean, obviously, in this herd, I can't see the matriarch very clearly. There's a few that are obscured by trees at the moment. But I mean, you can get matriarchs in the herd that will go as old as um, 60 years. Most of the elephants that we find in the Kruger system, which is where we are in South Africa, then because of the wooded environments, most of our it is, oh, there's a tiny, tiny baby. Look, there's a very little one. It's very small. So that one must be, oh, I don't even know, four or five months old. It's tiny. Look at that. Look how cute that is. <laughs> that's so cool. Wow. That's as cool as it gets. So, actually, getting back to your question, but um, the matriarchs, well, elephants in Kruger generally will only kind of get to normally the old ones, about 55. 50 is a, a fairly average age, and, and the reason why is because of the wooded environment that we're in, the teeth wear down quite quickly, and so they don't survive I mean, as long as some of the alleys that, uh, that occur in more grasslands areas and, and feed off softer diets. Um, but in terms of... of um, now, I forgot the last part of that question, Megan. Can you, can you repeat it for me? Sorry, I got so distracted by the little baby. I've... 
Ah, yes. And in terms of aging them, yes, you can use certain things to age them. Obviously, it's not an exact science, and we're going to have a situation situation where sometimes you, you'll get it wrong but generally overall size is one part of it tusk length um, is another thing that you can use to indicate sort of age obviously that depends also on area because if different areas have different size tusks here in, in the Kruger Park we find that the tusks are often very thick and quite short whereas you go into East Africa you'll find the tusks tend to be a little bit more narrow and longer than what you see here so it's not always useful to use in in, in different areas but general body size um, condition of the animal so if you see a Around the temple area around the eyes there's a section there and when that starts to sink in that starts to indicate a little bit of age with the ellies but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stop talking for a little bit just so you guys can hear because they're feeding so close to us that we can actually hear all of the moving of the feet and trunks and them kind of feeding and it's absolutely amazing How cool is that? Right, well, the ellies are starting to drift all around us now, and so we're going to probably think about a way to maybe just get out of here before we get too trapped. But it's been absolutely wonderful having all of you with us. I hope that you've enjoyed it, and I hope that you've loved this experience live from the middle of the wilderness in South Africa. It really has been a pleasure for both David and myself. And so until next time, we'll see you all again. Well, guys, is that just not the most spectacular elephants in sighting on foot? I think it's got to be one of my most favorite. Look at these two playing here. We have been absolutely spoiled. Now, we're going to just sit and see how this plays out because we are being enveloped by a herd at this stage. And so while we try and figure out how we're going to move from here, let's send you back across to Ralph and see if he's caught up with little Hosanna again. Well, yes, we have, and it seems like from a very exciting encounter with the elephants out on foot, we've come to a very sleepy Hosanna, who actually, I think now that we're sitting with him for a little while, he actually looks quite uncomfortable. I think he's maybe eaten a bit too much. He keeps on rolling backwards and forwards as if he can't get himself comfortable. And still very lots of very heavy breathing as well. Got his one paw up now. It's not like I'm worried about his health. It's just that he's probably overdone it a little bit, and he's uh, he's feeling it now. <laughs> Keeps rolling around trying to uh, get a better position, or uh, you know, I think it must be lots of pressure now in his belly. You can see with all the panting, he's definitely working hard at digesting all that meat. And I can tell you what, I don't want to be around when that starts to work its way through because it is going to be stinkorama. Muddy is such a pretty cat. It's just a shame he's a little bit in the shade there. And um, it's really already cooling down quite substantially now as uh, the sun starts heading towards the horizon. Um, and just in the background, down towards Voyatilla Dam, we've got some very concerned looking impala. And I'm just wondering, there they are, if they haven't got a bit of a swirly smell of Mr. Hosane here, or if they've um, smelt something else with the wind. The wind is directly in our face, um, so it... Uh, it would have had to swirl a little bit for them to get the smell of Asana. And they were looking down past the dam when they and they did do a bit of alarm calling. Um, but we're just wondering if it's not that they're picking up a bit of a scent somewhere and they're not quite sure. And so they're just a little bit edgy down there. They did look like they were going to go for a drink, but they seem to have stopped now as a result of them. Uh, smelling something, whether it's Hosano or another leopard, and you see now they're almost thinking against going for a drink at all. I think they're uh, a little bit too nervous, maybe. But here he is, the little chief, just really lounging it out. I think this will be him for the next day or two. 
and he's done well and he's really in his little holiday home now Bob you say what a fat cat absolutely look at that he's bulging it looks like he's gonna burst and uh, well I really think he's like in his holiday house here yeah? um, it's like he's finished school and dad's still looking after him but he hasn't got a job yet um, well I suppose he is paying rent uh, for with Tingana he's, uh, he's Tingana is coming to feed off of his kills now so, and I suppose uh, he deserves it if he's protecting the territory while his young son just comes in and enjoys himself but why wouldn't you Osana and I, I would really hope that this continues for a little while longer even make it a little bit more permanent Osana you are welcome to stay here for good Now, Ali, you wonder if th those Impala can smell the popcorn or the fresh smell of leopard urine with these guys nearby. Yeah, they could quite possibly. I don't know when. Uh, well, um, there were some viewers that came and did a visit at uh, camp just before we came on drive. And they said that they did see uh, Hosanna had gone down for a drink. So I don't know if he marked when he did that. He must have literally gone down for a drink and then come back up here near to where his carcass is stashed. So I don't know if he had time for a, a, a little marking session. Maybe he did. And now these impalas seem to be getting up the courage to walk towards the, the water. And they're very cautious. They do know that there's leopards around, I think. going just past the dam cam so you could probably you I don't think you could see Hosanna from the dam cam I don't think it can swivel this far back but uh, so you could almost watch on the dam cam the Impala coming in and, and then switch to us here with Hosanna just a about I would say about 80 meters up uh, the hill towards our camp so in a westerly direction from Voyotela Dam that little artificial water hole that is there now and so the Sun is starting to head towards the horizon and that would mean that the bushwalk team would be starting to make their way back towards camp sometime soon well not just yet Ralph because we're still being absolutely absorbed by this elephant encounter that we've had this has got to be one of my best walks i've had some epic elephant walks out here and this has got a rank is probably in my top three it really has been sensationally good and, and mostly because the elephants have no idea that we've been watching them all this time and it's been as close what's really interesting is they're right on the path that we used to get to this termite mound and they've actually been sniffing on that path they obviously picked up our scent and you can see now look they're moving off a little bit quicker because they picked up the scent on the pathway where we came through now I must be honest where we found ourselves on this mound is really thanks to Rex Rex has got an incredible sense when it comes to elephants and which way they're going to be moving and all of my best walks that I've had have been thanks to Rex so you know as much as we have skills I don't think we really pale in comparison to Herbie and Rex and we're so fortunate that we have the two of them to help out so for those of you who are new viewers and don't know who Rex is well Rex is one of the guys that looks after us and makes sure that we are safe out here so he's our game scout and he makes sure that we are looked after when we're on walk and while we're talking to all of you and really is an incredible guy he's got so much experience and like I say this sighting is mostly thanks to him he saw this termite mark from quite far away and said that's the one we need to get to and well hasn't he been right I mean look at this we're still sitting and in a vehicle this would be an amazing sighting to be on bushwalk and to have elephants this close and this clear of you is just phenomenal we've been spoiled you know Mary, yes I have been chased by an elephant more than once in fact I've been chased a few times in both vehicles and on foot um, obviously it's not ideal to be chased by an elephant and try and avoid it as much as possible see that elephant look how it's smelling so the lead elephant is sniffing right where we walk so you see how she's using a trunk so she's now picking up the scent of David and myself and Rex as we walked that's the pathway that we used to get up onto this mound so how interesting is that it just goes to show you how incredible their senses are I mean we walked there a good 20 minutes ago and yet she's still able he actually I mean she sorry is able to pick up 
the scent of where we were. Look at this. This is just spectacular. Wow. It doesn't get any better than this. I hope you guys are all enjoying it as much as I am. And actually, I would love to hear from all of you. So you guys can give me a one-word tweet as to what you think of the sighting and how you would feel if you were actually inside of this or on this termite mound with myself and David and Rex, how this would make you feel. So for me, it is just the most astounding experience. So that's going to be my word for the day. I'm having the best time. You can even see the sun is setting. Look, they're smelling us. How cool is this? <laughs> Wow. Like I say, it doesn't get any better than this. I mean, we've got perfect light, the most incredible animal in the, you know, in terms of social behaviors all around us and dust. It doesn't, it really doesn't get better. Like we are being absolutely privileged to be in the spot that we're in. Now, poor David, who's been holding a camera steady, remember that he's not shooting off a tripod, so he's been holding that camera locked off, has really done an sterling effort. So, like I say, we're pretty fortunate in the people that we work with. Often, us as presenters, we get a lot of credit for things, but it's a lot of the background staff that really do a great job. And like I say, Rex getting us into this position, and David, whose skill it was to be actually able to bring these, these visuals is pretty, pretty amazing. Deborah, humbled. I, I can promise you right now it is a humbling experience being in amongst these guys. So sitting here and just watching them feed around you and walk around you, they're massive animals and you do feel humbled. You feel pretty insignificant actually when these guys are all around. They make you have this ability to make you feel like the problems that you think you have in the world and uh, you know the, the if you've sort of in a bad place these guys have the ability just to take you out of that and, and make you remember just how incredible this world that we live in actually really is and so it's a very special thing to be here and look at that dust oh, it's amazing so sorry Megs can you just repeat that dailies are making a bit of noise around us and I missed it Lorena, you say goosebumps? Well, I can promise you that we all got goosebumps ourselves. It, it really doesn't get better than this. Like I said, this would be an epic elephant sighting on, foot, on, on a vehicle. I mean, I would be absolutely over the moon for a sighting like this on vehicle. But to be on foot and have this and this proximity and these kind of close-up intimate views and this dust bathing with the backlight, well, like I say, it doesn't really get any better. And so goosebumps is a very accurate term. And to be able to share it with you guys gives... It's just that much more of a special feeling, to be honest. So, Joe, you've decided one word is not enough to describe this, but you say absolutely magic. Well, I think you've summed it up perfectly. It is absolutely magic, isn't it? It doesn't really get any better than this, to be honest. And it's just continuing. It's not like they are going away. It's for some reason they're just hovering all around us. And so even though the sun is starting to dip, I don't think I really want to go anywhere. I'm absolutely happy sitting where I am at this stage. I feel as content as content could be. It's almost just any stress that you have in life. It kind of disappears when sitting like this. Hillary, privileged for sure. We are very privileged. We're privileged in that there's parts of the world like the Sabi Sands that still exist where we can watch Ellie's like this on foot. Um, you know, these areas are protected and because of the fact that they're protected and hunting and those kind of things have been taken away, the Ellie's are a little bit more trusting of people and allow these kind of closer encounters. And so we're very, very privileged to be able to do this and very privileged that, you know, all of you are actually watching because if it wasn't for all of you, we wouldn't really be out here doing any of this at this stage. So this is a very, very cool thing that we've managed to kind of put together and to be a part of it is very special. Oh, look at this, this elephant. So to give you an idea of the distance from that elephant to David, I reckon, what are you, made 10 meters, not even? Five meters? Now you see she's noticed that we're here. So she's the first one to actually have picked us up. Now we're completely safe because we're on top of this mound and she doesn't actually know what we are just yet. She can see that there's something on top here and she can hear something so she's just going to guide her baby backwards and then she'll go around. If she thought that we were really a threat she would have definitely been a lot more aggressive. So she's just picked up that there's something not quite right at this mound but she doesn't know what it is. You can see her tail is 
going a little bit erect now, but not too bad. If she was really upset, that tail would be stiff, 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 and you would find a situation where she would have probably had a bit of a mock charge at David. But, David, have you ever been that close to an elephant on foot? No. So that's the closest David's ever been. How do you feel, David? David says it's awesome. Yes, well, David, you've been spoiled, my friend. It is probably one of the best elephant encounters I've seen in a very long time. And David had a front row seat. I'm behind David at the moment because, well, this buffalo thorn is not making it very easy for us to position ourselves on this mound. And I've already had one buffalo thorn poke me in the backside, which was not very comfortable. And so I'm behind the mound because there's just not enough space where David is to get the clearest shot. So I do apologize if you haven't seen my face. It's mostly because the alleys are all around us and there's really no way to get to where it's a comfortable kind of place for everybody. So, But isn't this just amazing? <laughs> wow very special here comes the little baby now the last of the little babies is right at the back of the herd on the right hand side David I don't know if you can see it it should come past us now so the herd will slowly move along that pathway and then we should start to see the littlest one just in amongst the feet of the adults there it comes hello little one <laughs> how cute is that this is amazing now the, the thing about these elephant walks is that, you know, it, it just goes to show with a bit of experience and a bit of kind of knowledge of what goes on, you can actually have very kind of safe walks with Ellie's. A lot of people, and I've seen it through the years, training individual guides will often say that an elephant is not something that you ever approach on foot and that you should never try go near breeding herds of elephants. But actually, if you do it the right way and you're very conscious of the, the factors involved and the kind of how things work and, and your environmental conditions, you can have the most amazing experiences with Ellie's if you just kind of check things out to make sure that you just pay attention to small little things. And you can see here these Ellie's are in no way stressed by us. They're still feeding most of them. There's been one female that realized there was something amiss but didn't really know what it was. And so we've really kind of inserted ourselves in amongst them but haven't disturbed them too much and haven't really had a situation where we've had a negative impact on them. So. You know, it it's just goes to show that Ellie's are an animal that can be approached on foot if done in the correct way. And, and like I say, it's thanks to the skills of guys like Rexon that we're able to get into positions like this. Right, I was saying just now that poor David has been holding this camera for the majority of the sighting. We've been here in a very uncomfortable position, and so we're going to give him a little break. And while we do that, let's send you back across to Ralph and, well, a very special character of his own. Well, here we are back with Hosanna, and we've got the sinister character of a hyena having joined the fray. Look at that. What has it picked up? Has it got a little bone there that's fallen down? Now, I want you just to look on the back there. Those wounds. Now, when we were sitting with uh, Hukumuri and the hyenas, that was a little while ago. Um, the hyenas came in and stole his uh, impala and later he stole it back from them and then he was up on the branch and there was one female that came around and she had a very very nasty wound on the back there both sides I don't know if it was a bite from a lion or something like that but it looked terrible at the time and look at that now I'm I'm almost certain that it's the same animal and it has healed up almost completely so that is actually fascinating and I was just saying to to Ferg that these um, hyena are tough as nails and real battle axes they don't even worry she wasn't even limping when she had these those terrible wounds and um, she was right in there fighting for the meat um, and it seems like now she has uh, shaken off the wounds completely, so healed up. Well done. I can't remember. I don't know if it was June. Um, the hyena called June. The hyena um, specialist will very quickly be able to tell me uh, which one this is. Might have been a June, um, but I, I might be wrong. Um, I remember them identifying her at the time, but this one now, obviously, just. Having got a little piece of the meat below the tree that uh, that Hosanna had taken it up into, and he's just sitting looking at the hyena now, crunching those bones. There he is. He's not even bothered that this hyena's around. They did have a look at each other. 
that they sort of just almost nodded at each other and then carried on. If you listen carefully, you can hear the bones crunching from this hyena going down again. Just trying to get, I think there's not much on that. It's just bones, really. I always love it when the hyenas pitch up, it just means there's going to be some action. Has it just swallowed those bones down? <laughs> it's incredible. They are like hoovers. Looking up into the tree where there is a little bit left on that carcass, it's just like bones and skin and a little bit of uh, the leftover meat sort of just right on the bone. So there's not much. Hosanna is really, really tucked in there, but I'm sure that this hyena would love to get at the bones there. Just walking around wishing that it could climb trees. Ah, okay. Chris, you said that this is, is it Sarta? Was that the right word? Sarta, um, Megan? Uh, T-S-A-K-A, -A, Tsaka. All right, a dominant male at that. Yeah, because I thought it's quite a big one. I thought that it was a female. If you're saying that it's a male, um, but I'm still sure that this was the individual that had those wounds a while ago. Uh, that we saw. I'm still sure of that. And and Chris, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, those wounds look identical to the ones that we saw um, when Okomori was um, fighting with them over that impala carcass. And then it made an appearance. I don't know if you can remember that, um, but um, I think, Ferg, you were with me, yeah, eh? I was with you, yeah. Yeah, it does look like that exact same spot and on the other side as well. And that was an amazing sighting, that too. And I mean, once, because first uh, two hyenas pitched up and stole the impala carcass from Hukumuri, and then uh, and they started uh, feeding on it a little bit, and then all of a sudden he burst onto the scene and grabbed it and took it onto a log that was overhanging the drainage line. And so the hyenas couldn't get to him. And as soon as they realized that they couldn't get to him and obviously then have the meat all for themselves, uh, which was only two of them, they started whooping. And it was incredible. Within seconds, we had more than 10 hyenas on, on the scene. They came running out of nowhere. And, um, and this one, I'm sure, was one of them. And they still couldn't obviously get to the, um, the carcass. Now it's just starting to walk behind us a little bit. But it's going across... Now, take care. You're asking a very good question. Sorry, but we'll, we'll work around it. This way a little bit. Now, that slopey back that they have, it's going to come right next to us in the vehicle. It's actually crazy that hyenas, normally they are quite sort of skittish and they run away from us. Um, but when there's meat around, look how they just, they are completely different beasts. Now, take care. That sort of loping or sloping back that they have, um, that is, it is an evolutionary um, trait. And what it has enabled them to do is run for very, very long distances. So it enables them to have much more endurance uh, with that very big front quarter and, and much smaller hind quarters. And it's sloping back. It means that... Um, they can run not at very high speeds um, in comparison to a lot of the other predators, but they can maintain a speed for hours. Um, and I've witnessed it a few times in Namibia when once they start a hunt and you think, you know, they're after a, uh, an ostrich or an oryx um, and they start chasing it um, and the oryx or the ostrich, whatever it is, runs off. Um, and you'd think that it's over, but these guys just carry on and they're relentless. Um, so they'll, they'll eventually start catching up uh, with their prey 
um, and they'll just continue to chase it. And they, you know, I've even seen animals lying down before the hyenas get there, um, and then obviously just rip it to pieces. But um, they can just continue running um, at about 30, 35 kilometers per hour, uh, you know, for four to five hours. Um, they can really, really run for long distances. And they can cover huge areas. It is stunning. Um, so, And that enables them to do that with that very sloped back like that. And you see how he walks? Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. Now, proud cat mama, yeah, they do have a couple of advantages over predators. One of them being, as I was uh, chatting about, they are tough as nails. Um, you know, the kind of that kind of in injury that this one had might have, um, uh, you know, been felt a lot worse on on most of the other predators, uh, leopard and lions. Um, and with hyenas, they are just so resilient that uh, they just come back from from it and almost don't even notice that they have the injury. Um, that's one thing. Very powerful um, front uh, front legs, um, as well as that neck and the head. Um, and so and that enables them to go into skirmishes and fights with leopard and lion, um, and and be able to really give their own back. Um, added to the fact that they have an extremely powerful jaw um, that uh, uh, it's it's almost the same power as, as a big male lion and if you look at them in relative size uh, it, it does say that their, their jaw it relatively is uh, much stronger than a, than a lion's but it, but ultimately they, they they're not uh, way stronger than lions um, or, or more p pressure than lions they just um, it's just all relative. So Hosanna now just sort of nonchalantly watching the hyena off and now gone back to sleep. Um, right, while he dozes off, let's head you back to the bushwalk team. I have just been to Twins Dam and I'm trying to see if I can find something very interesting but it is very very quiet at the moment I haven't picked up any fresh tracks and the fact that I haven't picked up the fresh tracks does not mean things are not happening animals are not only checking the road not only walking on the road some of them they're using different pathways which can make it very difficult for me to see what's happening so the chances are very high to see anything at the moment So I am now at the western side of the game reserve. I started from the eastern side. So this side, all the way down to here, it has been very much quiet. Here yes, I've seen just a couple of impalas, but uh, not any of the cats. But if I can find a fresh track. Uh, Costa, I didn't get that question very well. If you can repeat um, FC. Uh, Costa, I am not too sure about the exact distance of the elephants traveling away before giving birth. So, but uh, I don't think they can travel a very long distance because elephants, when they give birth, the other ones. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm not too sure about the amount of, of uh, travel elephants could have in their whole life. So those are some of the things I still have got to check. But elephants, they can travel long, long hours and a lot of kilometers every day. 
Something which is very much important to consider when checking the movement of these animals is the water availability. The dry seasons, such as the, reasons, the season we are now here in South Africa, some of the rivers, they become dry and some of the water hole becomes dry and that forces the animals to travel long distances. So I am right approaching all the different open spaces just to see if there is any luck. But no tracks, nothing. So now let's see what Hosanna uh, is uh, planning to do on the other side. Well, he's just got his head up because we can hear a little bit of contact calling from these hyenas that are just off in the distance. I don't think we can see them, but we can hear them. I don't know if you can see them up there, Ferg, uh, but it seems like there's two of them now. They're doing a bit of a ooh, funny noise, not a real whoop. Definitely seemed like more like contact calling. And that's why I love being around a carcass or where there's meat. Um, like what Hosanna has put up in the tree here because you always know that the hyenas could make an appearance and just shake things up a bit keep this very sleepy leopard on his toes now I just want to say thanks firstly to uh, Chris Rogue for identifying that uh, hyena that came past um, and then I also want to say thanks to James Richard he managed to very quickly get us uh, a picture of Tsaka's um, uh, wounds. I'll just show you on my phone there. Those were the wounds at the Hukumuri sighting and it seems like that was on June 20, uh, June 10. I think it was on the 10th of June um, that we sighted that. And look at the, the healing now um, in comparison. So that's what it looked like. Um, and as I say, now it just totally healed itself up. So wonderful and, and just shows the resilience hey, of uh, of these hyenas that is just stunning it's it's out of this world i think these hyenas that you know almost never say die we should call them cunny duets which means cannot die now sal quite right uh if there are hyenas around uh, hosanna does need to just be a little bit careful because they could come on over and uh and just uh, if they felt like it, you know, have a go at him. Um, but generally, they're more interested in actually just getting that meat. So um, it's it's mostly when predators are next to the meat, or when they the hyenas come in, they want the meat, and the leopard is actually protecting it. Um, that's when they're going to come into full-on contact. As we can see there, there's an impala there in the background. Uh, there's quite a few of them now coming in, but uh, they're safe, I would say, tonight. Osana is not going to be doing any tackling uh, of antelope anytime soon. I don't even know if he'll be able to lift himself off the floor himself, <laughs> the way his stomach looks. And you can still see him panting. He's been doing that for the better part of the afternoon. Really, really full, happy cat. And a very cool cat as well, Mr. Hosanna, our pet leopard. <laughs> He's listening out still, watching and listening. As I say, I don't know if he's going to even go bother going back to that little bit of bones that is and skin that's left hanging in the tree. Maybe might go, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's just left there now, left as a Christmas tree decoration. We've got some of those in other parts of the reserve as well. All right, so as I said, the sun is now just about set, if not as has set, and we're in that last little bit of golden light. So let's head you off to the bushwalk team before they head home. Well, indeed, Ralph, we're just trying to hustle our way back to camp. We left the Ellies, they were 
still casually feeding their way. And in fact, actually, if any of you are watching the dam cam, I would give it a few hours, but I think that's where they're heading. We left them going straight north in the block, and Rex reckons that they're going to head towards the dam. So I'm sure they'll come and have a little drink later and join Hosanna and all of the hyenas that are there. So just trying to kind of cover some distance as quick as we can. It was such an epic sighting that that you know, kind of on a high a little bit after that whole thing. And David said to me is his best elephant sighting he's had on foot. And, well, I, I must agree, David. It was very good. Now, yesterday, it's not very often, in fact, that we have a chance to meet new animals out here. You know, obviously, we have a situation where a lot of our animals are very territorial. But yesterday, I had the afternoon off, and I had some friends that were staying at Inkoro. So I went to go and say hello to them and went out on a drive with them yesterday afternoon and went to go and kind of just, you know, see what was going on. And I was very lucky that I actually met, well, three different sets of cats that I hadn't seen before, which was quite nice. So I managed to catch up with Inkanyeni's daughter, who's about, from what I believe, the guys told me that she's about seven months old beautiful little female and she was very relaxed and she was sitting posing on termite mounds and on branches and, and those kind of things so that was thoroughly enjoyable and she seems like she's going to be a beautiful little girl so that was really nice then we saw the torture pride so i had never seen them before they were just resting and relaxing and the tracks that we had followed the day before from the torturers had gone from chitwa onto Nkoro and they were resting there and kind of just having a really lazy lion, um, which was really nice. So they're beautiful lions, and they look really good condition. And then I got to meet the cheetah family too, which was quite nice. So I had a bit of a crazy drive yesterday afternoon. We had elephants and cheetah and lion and leopard and all kinds of other things. So I got very spoiled. But the cheetah family was absolutely amazing. They were up on these termite mounds with the sunset, playing and going crazy, stalking everything that moved. It was absolutely amazing. So I had a very, very productive last 24 hours that's for sure good well we're going to try and kind of negotiate the little upslope to camp before it gets too dark and so while we do that let's send you back across to sydney and hopefully he's going to get some luck as darkness closes in what a beautiful sunset look at that look at the reflection of the sun up by those clouds this is lovely. Africa is beautiful. Sunset by the Juma Game Reserve is phenomenal. I have been seeing quite a lot of sunset before, but here by Juma, I think it looks different. The positioning, the western side of the Kruger National Park towards the western direction is located nicely and suitable for the sunset. Look at that. Laura, it is a big wow. This is very much beautiful. It's quite very interesting watching the sun going down. Look at that. So now I can feel that the temperature is cooling down. So now... Okay, everyone, look at this. We've just had three hyenas come in now and chase Hosanna. Uh, there was all sorts of snarls and growls from the hyena and um, they just came out of nowhere. And tails up and that's when you know you've got to be careful because... Uh, they mean business. And as soon as there was more than one... Right, let me just go forward and then we can see Hosanna there a little bit. I'll just take my handbrake off. And just see if we can slowly move forward here. And he's just disappeared next to that termite mound there. There he is. Watch. How's that, Fig? A little bit more. That'll do. There we go. And now it's going over towards him again. There he goes. Oh, he just take himself out of the danger zone, I say. But these hyenas probably think that he's hiding some meat. And maybe they want to eat that meat that's in his belly. You can see he's a walking T-bone steak. <laughs> oh, 
They always find these hyenas incredible. Eh? As soon as there's more than one, they just grow an extra arm and a leg. And he's just slinking off through the grass. I can just see him there, but he's behind a tree. That he's slowly walking off. Well, at least we know now that he can walk. I'm actually going to start up in a bit and just go and get up there with him. Hyenas seem to be following him, so there's no point staying here. And we can catch up with him and see what's going on there. Okay, I, I, I think th this is really cool, but I think these, if you see now these hyenas, they're probably just going to walk off because there doesn't seem to be really any meat available for them, and I think that's their frustration. There's no meat available, but they can smell it, um, and you know, so that's why they're going to want to take it out on the leopard um, and just see if he's not hiding any meat because they can smell it. That's the trouble. Now, where did he go? Went off this way, hey. This way. We just got to keep our eyes open, everyone. He's walked, he did come this way. I thought he carried on. Does hyena follow him? Oh, there he is. Tracy, um, you want to know if these hyenas would attack Hosanna? Absolutely. They they pretty much did try to attack him right now, um, but he got up and ran off. Um, so well done, Hosanna, of getting out of the way of those pesky hyenas, uh, because they would definitely be his match and I think they would have sorted him out. He was hissing and snarling at them, and they also then growled um, and ran at him. As soon as there were two next to each other, they sort of uh, present a real front, and they ran at him quite fast, um, and that's where he just took his leave. He immediately jumped up and ran off, um, because he's, he probably knows uh, these hyenas very well. He, that's not the first altercation he's had with hyenas. I'm sure of it. So he's now at least been woken up by them. And uh, as I say, that's uh, the beauty of hyenas. They definitely don't let things settle uh, or, uh, you know, people uh, or animals drop their guard because uh, they're going to come in and shake things up. And that's one of the reasons why I really enjoy having them around. So, Mr. Hosanna, yeah, you mustn't sleep too soundly, my friend. These hyenas will come and wake you up. Now, Angelique, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, leopards are much faster than hyenas on short distances, uh, but uh, hyenas would um, would outrun them in the in in a longer run. Uh, they they would definitely. Um, eventually catch up with them and then, you know, be able to either run past them or, you know, for whatever reason, they would be able to catch them, you know. So in terms of the speed, um, leopards have got short bursts of acceleration and very, very uh, good at that. Whereas a hyena is not a much of a, of, in terms of acceleration, but they can just maintain a speed uh, for many, many, many kilometers. Um, and so that's they're, they're like the long distance runners where the um the leopard is more of a sprinter over short distances still lots of panting and now he's he's a lot more awake now oh that's a nice yawn what you gonna do you're gonna head back and there's Hyenas, they, they, it looks like those hyenas have headed up towards quarantine. And now, Mr. Hosanna, maybe he'll make his way back towards that spot. Now, Zina, I, don't, I haven't seen hyenas uh, eating leopard scat except... Um, now, I, I'm just thinking about it. I have seen them eating it. Um, especially those first few... Uh, defecations or scats after they fed. So if, um, if uh, Hosanna had to uh, have a poo now, um, those hyenas could definitely come and have some of it because it's normally very sloppy um, and it also be, you know, almost bloody. Uh, it's quite black 
Um, and there is another vehicle coming in now. So just so that you know if you hear a, a vehicle. So yes, the, the hyenas can definitely come in and, and, and have some of that first uh, passing. Right, so we're sitting here with uh, this beautiful animal with spots. And let's head you on over to an animal with stripes. Quite a very lovely animal, the zebra. Look at those beautiful stripes. So each one of them has got its own stripe pattern. So the stripe pattern on these animals are like our fingerprints. So they are very much relaxed, not doing anything. Some of them, they are just having their final grazing. So look at that stomach. So both male and females, they have got big, big stomachs. So they all look pregnant. Oh, I just get something now. You know, zebras, if you tease them, they are just going to release gas and run away. You will hear the gas coming out. So these, these stomachs, they are just very big because of too much gas is there. But the purpose of releasing the gas is not a defense mechanism. So it's just that they've got to uh, pull and have power before they run. When they're trying to get power, that is when they release that gas. Look at that. The whole body is camouflaged except there behind the ears. So maybe they are using that back part of the ear for communication purposes. One of the ways they are using to communicate silently. The ear is always moving. So James, the zebra stripes don't match up. It has to be unidentical so that they can easily distinguish each other uh, within the harems. Harem is a social structure of the zebra. It means this group we are seeing here is led by one dominant male. You will see after birth, they isolate themselves a little bit just to have the little one to imprint the spots from the parents. This is quite very beautiful. I just, I'm just going to reverse a little bit so that we can see them from a nice angle. Look at that. So that one is on top of the termite mound. So the termite mound is very much hard. Luke is now supporting the weight of this zebra. Look at that. So if you disturb this zebra, it's going to run. And before they run, when they get that power, So now let's see what Tristan has got on the other side. I will wait a little bit here. Well, we thought we were done for the evening, but as we got into quarantine, we've had two surprises. One was the three boys of the Hyena clan, Juma clan, that were in the area that kind of walked past us. And unfortunately, they ran past us rather than actually walked. But the other is a set of eggs that we found, which is very, very cool. So it's that time of the year where we're going to start seeing a few of the lapwing eggs. So this is what I would imagine is from either a Senegal lapwing or maybe a crowned lapwing, one of the two of them. And you can see how well camouflaged they are. So the three of them are just sitting here in amongst this grass and the egg color is absolutely perfect. It's really difficult actually to see them. And if it wasn't for the fact that I almost stepped on them, I wouldn't have seen them. So really cool to see. And we'll try and monitor these eggs and see if there's a bit more success with these ones than there was with the previous sets from last year. Because last year we had quite a few of these eggs that didn't make it and had a situation where unfortunately given the amount of jackals and white-tailed mongoose and genets and those kind of things that move around in this area we kind of unfortunately lost all of the eggs that we knew about it's not to say obviously that they don't raise eggs they obviously do otherwise we wouldn't have any of those birds but in this particular section we haven't seen them develop but we'll keep monitoring those and every day we'll kind of come in and check up and see how they're doing i'm quite surprised though that there's no adult there now maybe it flew away when the hyenas came past because it just wanted to get out of the way of them and divert attention away from its 
eggs. But it's interesting to kind of see that they are out and about already. It's quite early in the season to be having bird's eggs. Anyway, we are going to head home now because it is getting very dark. And so while we head back home, let's send you back across to Sydney with, well, a rather stripy figure. So the zebras, they're just having their final grazing now. I can see they are all arranging themselves now, going towards a place where they're going to rest. These are part of the diurnal animals. Diurnals are the animals that are active during the day. So now they are going to give the other ones chance who are active during the night. So you can see they are not feeding anymore. Now they are going home. So what I'm going to do now is I am now going to start looking for the nocturnals because zebras they have already given me a sign that now it's time for those that are active during the night. I'll be looking for the bush babies and the, some of the nocturnal birds and see if I can find something interesting. I've already picked up quite a lot of different calls to show that the nocturnal life has started. So the animals that are active during the night, they have got excitement now. So I want to see them. Uh, I want to see their happiness now. <laughs> So let me see what I'm going to find for you this evening. Well, I wish you all the best of luck, Sydney. Let's see uh, if you can find us some bush babies. That would be great if you could find one that hangs around. Well, at least we've got something that's hanging around. He's not going anyways, Mr. Hosana, unless the hyenas come back and give him a few problems again that for the minute he seems to have totally relaxed once more um, he watched those hyenas walking off and they've probably also realized that there's no meat begging at the moment except for what's in his belly and the little night birds and are starting to call now at the moment Now, take care. Um, well, the leopards don't have spots on their nose because it's it's more on their coat, not on their fur. Um, so it's all down to their fur uh, pattern, not the skin. So on their nose, it's generally um, that sort of uh, black and pink, sometimes more black than pink, and other times, uh, like uh, I think Tumbad is, has got a bit more a lot more pink than black and and um Osana as well he's got quite a pink nose um but uh, yeah not spots as uh, as there is on the on the coat or on the fur as you see there but he does have a very very nice spot pattern does Mr Hosana and he doesn't have any real injuries uh, of note um that uh, makes his uh, coat look a bit scraggly or and uh, you can see with Tingana obviously he's a much older cat and his his coat doesn't look as as nice and shiny and new as Hosanna's he's obviously just getting a little bit older and almost gray you know so and I have heard reports that um, uh, over on Torchwood uh, it seems Tandy and Tlalamba have been found and um, followed by Tingana. So he's moving up behind Tandi and Tlalamba. I wonder what he's, um, what he's uh, doing by doing that. I wonder what's going on over there. And uh, I'll let you know as the reports come in that the Juma guides have managed to find her uh, over on that side. So very interesting that Tingana's following them. I wonder what he's up to. Because I was hoping a little bit earlier when we saw the Impala alarm calling, uh, we were hoping that it was Tingana on his way. So we quickly drove down there and quickly realized that uh, it must have just been a bit of a swirling smell from Mr. Hosana. Um, because it was at that time that I got the report over the radio and then obviously realized that Tingana is not anywhere near us. He's over on Torchwood following Tandi and Tlalamba. 
at least we know that the mother and daughter are together and interesting now that um, Tingana is following them so we'll see what happens with that hopefully they come back onto Juma all three of them Now, Yvette, I think uh, when leopards lie on the ground, it's just obviously a lot more comfortable. They can lie flat. Uh, it's almost like the difference between sleeping, I would say, in a hammock or sleeping on a nice flat bed. Um, if you sleep, in, when the leopards sleep in the tree, I would say it's, it's like sleeping in a hammock. It's not as comfortable uh, completely as a, as, a, as a nice flat bed. As, and, and you can't stretch out like you can on the ground so obviously safer up in the trees but uh, not quite as comfortable and look when it's nice and hot on a, on a hot summer's day it might be better to go up in the trees because you can uh, try to escape the, uh, the flies as well as get a bit of a breeze maybe it's a bit cooler up there so different times call for different actions and it's nice and cool this evening I think uh, Osana is more after a nice comfortable spot rather than uh, the temperature or trying to evade it and there's no insects around it's nice and cool so it's actually perfect he keeps looking over towards where that uh, little bit of remains of the impala is and maybe he's going to make his way over there now he's up and ready I don't think you are in any condition to be hunting, Mr. Hosanna. And that belly, look how it's bulging. You never know, you might <laughs> smack an impala here. Yeah? But I doubt it. his way back towards those skin and bones. And we are, sorry just a reminder that we are in the infrared camera. Now Terry, um, as far as I know, I think I think these guys can get the, the cat flu um, that domestic cats get. Um, Unless you can, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that they can. They can also get something called FIDS, which is pheno, um, the, the feline version of AIDS. Um, so they do get a couple of very specific feline diseases. And he's going to do exactly what I said earlier, probably have his first poo after that um, big feed he's had. And that could always um, become a bit of hyena food. They might move in and have that. At least nothing's wasted. So just in the background there, that's the, the, the Vuyatella Lodge. So there's even a couple of guests that were just watching from the fence. I think he must have just had a pee there, I think. Just sauntering back on over towards the tree and those bones are no rush required that fat belly swaying from side to side once he gets off into into the distance or if he We're gonna, there's a vehicle just coming past. We're just gonna maybe go and get a little bit closer, hey? Let's do that. All right, so while we get on closer to Osana, let's, uh, let's go see how uh, Sydney's nocturnal animal search is going. Still very much difficult to find the nocturnals at the moment. All I'm seeing are all the die owners moving back, going to their resting places. I've got a very big herd of the impalas now moving towards the southern side of the game reserve. And they're just, oh, look at that. 
unexpectedly. Not too sure what is the problem. Maybe there's something. They are curious. You can see the ears. So let's see what they're going to see there. They just got frightened by something. So all these females passing by here, they, they might be belonging to one of the males. So they also do harems. One male in charge of several females. So a harem kind of social structure, it is highly supported by my... So let's quickly go to Ralph. Well, everyone, sorry, we were just a little bit slow there uh, in catching up with him, but he's now jumped back up into the tree, and I think maybe he just want to have a last little bit of that uh, that impala that he's stashed there. Not much at all. Oh, I think that's a piece of it. Unless that was just a, a branch that fell down. A bit of the impala, I think. So the hyenas might be back then, drop down there somewhere. And if the hyenas come back, they might get a little bit of a treat. I'm with lions. Um, so it's flies that they, they try to get away from mostly. Um, and the, yeah, so and that's normally in the height of summer. And it's very hot and they can get quite um, incredibly irritating in the flies. Well, sorry about that, everybody. Just a little bit of an internet problem, but we're back and we're watching our sauna now starting to uh, eat the head of the impala. So if you're a little bit squeamish, it might be a little bit much for you. He's getting on into the eyes and he might start eating the sort of uh, mouth area, normally just above the teeth. So it seems to be quite a bit of meat there that I often see the cats like. And then maybe going on to the neck, and so it's, it can be quite gory. And if you don't really like that, then uh, I suggest you you maybe uh, switch off and come back tomorrow. Because we're, we're sort of heading uh, slowly but surely towards the end of the show. You could always wait until uh, maybe see what Sydney's been uh, going to be able to find. But I'm probably going to be here um, until the end of things. So that's um, just so that you can plan for yourself. Um, but yeah, for the rest of you, we're going to sit and... Uh, Continue watching this leopard feeding now. And there, he's going to get stuck into that now. now. I mean, with that also, there's, the brains would also be there. Um, and so I think I might just get us a little bit closer so that we can put this infrared light on it um, and, and get a bit of a clearer view. Not that I'm a sadist and I like watching uh, uh, Impala die, but it, it does make for a better picture. While I'm doing that, off to Sydney uh, with his spotlight. I have got some wildebeest there. They are nervous a little bit, they're just running around everywhere. I'm not too sure what is happening, but uh, they, they seem very frightened. But now I can see everything is back to normal. The blue wildebeest, they are also active during the day now. They are going to their resting areas. And the direction they're heading now is towards the eastern side where there is quite a lot of bigger openings. So they might be going to rest by the open areas. So you can see it's quite a number of them there. So this is one of the animals which is believed not to have a good eyesight. But now I'm seeing them just alone. They don't have zebras as they do. So look there. 
through these bushes you can see there that they are quite a number of them there they are not feeding at this stage the feeding time has ended now is the time for them to look for a safety safety place to hide so one of them is trying to lead now because they were disorientated by something earlier on i saw they were very much relaxed moving but something just happened and then they decided to it's quite a lot of them there it's quite a big head it looks like it's a migratory movement at this stage Yes, the wildebeest, they are very much um, popular when it comes to the migration. It's just that here in South Africa, at the migration, it doesn't take place here. Look at that. Uh, hi, Fox. The blue wildebeest, they've got a very good hearing and also a good sense of smell. Yes, the sighting is not that very good, but a sense of smell and hearing is very good. So that is why some of the animals, they come and feed next to them in order to uh, depend on them when it comes to the hearing. So I'm just going to uh, drive down here and see if we can have a better sighting. Uh, Christy, the blue wildebeest, they prefer to go and spend their night by the open areas. Some of them, you will find them lying down on the road. They know in the thick bushes they can easily get ambushed. Look at that. It's a sense of... Just focus that side. I can see now I've got a better visual on them. You can see it's quite a lot of them here. So now this is the beginning of the open space where we are now. So it means for tonight they are going to be uh, hiding somewhere in these areas. So look at that. So let me just pull forward and see the wildebeest when they approach the open space. Well, Mr. Hosanna, really getting into this head now, uh, he's bitten off the little piece of tongue that was sticking out the side of that impala's mouth. And now, just as I thought, he's gone onto the sort of um, schnoz or the uh, muzzle and the nose area. Uh, part there's normally quite a bit of meat there and then running up towards the the forehead uh, so it's almost like he's you know very often the last little bits um are getting eaten here i see lots of licking as well it does help to wet it and uh, you know in a, in a little bit of a way help to uh, ease it as, as he's trying to bite off this little bits that uh, that he could if he could he would also probably bite right into that skull because the brains in there also very very highly nutritious, got a lot of protein in there, and probably quite tasty for him as well. Um, as I said, I would say most of the cats are quite partial to all the organs. Um, I remember my little cat at home, uh, well he wasn't that small, he was actually cross African wild cat Burmese. He used to bring home uh, scrub hairs and uh, massive rats and eat them under my bed. But there was always one little part 
in particular that he left behind. I don't know if it was the gallbladder. It was always like a round organ, a very hard organ uh, that he left behind. And that sometimes that's how, the only reason I knew that he had eaten a rat under my bed was because there was always this gallbladder or what I don't know if any of you know what part I might be speaking about and if you have the same experience maybe with your cat at home uh, let us know on the hashtag safari live on Twitter because um, it was really peculiar that every single time and it was quite specific with rats as well but uh, I don't think Hosanna is going to be leaving anything behind here. And what he does, and all drops to the ground, the hyenas are going to be around and they're going to finish that off. Now, Lauren, I would have to say the most nutritious part is probably um, the, the brains, as I say. But in their, of their face, uh, it's that part just above, you know, the, well, around the nose area. You often see them just getting in there. Now, I think he's trying to get into that skull, uh, but it might be a bit too hard. So he's really just struggling getting his teeth in there. And this could be him just carrying on with this for a while now, just... Sort of picking off the last little bits of tasty pieces. And you might have a go at the neck as well. There'll also be a bit of meat there. And those eyes are still there, so you could also get in there. And I know it sounds quite gory. But, folks, we are slowly heading now towards the end of the show. It's been uh, another fantastic day, another wonderful sunset safari. Um, and thanks to the FC uh, folks and the other guides that were out both this morning and the afternoon and there's going to be another show tomorrow so don't miss out and we'll see you then bye for now everybody and thanks for watching